and get started with today's Agency Operations Committee meeting. I want to welcome everyone uh, today to July, to the 20 July 2013 meeting of the Agency of Operations Committee. I'd like to remind everyone that uh, this meeting is being broadcast live via the internet. Um, my name is Bobby Jenkins. I'm actually the co-chair of this committee. Um, Manir Lalani is uh, ill and unfortunately won't be able to join us today, and we wish him a speedy recovery, and uh, our, our best thoughts and prayers are with him. Uh, the first action item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from the April 24th, 2013 committee meeting. Uh, the minutes were sent to all the members for review on July 10th. Are there any questions or corrections to the minutes that were sent out? Move to approve. I have a motion to move. Do I have a second? second. And a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. The next agenda item, I'd like to call on Dr. Alonzo to introduce the topics for this meeting's report. Uh, he will provide us some background information and introduce other presenters. These items uh, will require no action. Dr. Alonzo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have three reports under agenda item three. I will briefly, briefly present uh, item A, which is our quarterly financial report. I will call on Elaine Lang to present our update on our continuous improvements initiative, and then I will come back and present the final one, which is our <coughs> compliance monitoring uh, initiative. Item 3A is our standing quarterly financial report. Uh, today's report, which was sent to you two weeks ago, uh, is as of June 30th. And for your convenience, I think we've placed another copy here in, in case you have not, uh, uh, didn't bring yours with you. Uh, but, but it's also uh, like I said, it was sent to you, but it, it should be at your places. Uh, this report shows that with two months left in the fiscal year, we are on track to expand our funds as appropriated. Uh, and in the final two months, we closely, we, we, well, we closely manage the budget uh, throughout the year. But in the final two months of the fiscal year, we start managing um, and taking a little bit more uh, hands-on approach at the agency level to ensure that the funds are spent, encumbered, or if allowed, uh, carried forward to the next biennium. As is customary with our last couple of years of the, uh, excuse me, last couple of the uh, months of the fiscal year, we look very closely at any potential balances that may exist. And if we have to, we will make transfer within our 20% authority. We have authority to transfer 20% uh, within strategies. I do want to point out that the financial report that you have before you includes $81.4 million of additional funds that were appropriated by the legislature under House Bill 1025. House Bill 1025, uh, if you recall, was the supplemental appropriation for the rest of FY13. The courting board received $81.4 million. Those appropriations were made to us for Graduate, graduate medical education in the amount of $9.25 million. Family practice, uh, $7.75 million. Uh, Hazelwood exemption, the legacy program, $30 million. And the Texas Research Incentive Program, TRIP as we call it, for $34.4 million. So those balances are in included in there because obviously we just received them and uh, we are working with the divisions in, in the business office to expand, to encumber, or carry forward if we have to, those funds. And in fact, tomorrow during the board meeting, there will be some items, uh, some items that will be brought before the board to contract and to expand those funds. Um, so, Mr. Chairman and members, uh, uh, that's a brief overview of, of the report. I will be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Uh, uh, the GME money, um, do um, the schools have to apply now for those positions to use that money in the fall? Actually, I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, yes, we have somebody here that can answer that question. Uh, Stacy was going to be here, but she had to go to, uh, to oh. another meeting. So. Yes, I understand. Uh, Thank you. 
I'm Suzanne Pickens, and I'll be managing those GME programs. And some of them, uh, they're actually uh, the appropriation from 10, are you asking just about the ones for 1025 appropriation? The supplemental. The supplemental, because there were also some in another bill that went into the Senate right. Bill 1. I know there was a lot of interest in getting uh, 2013 moving forward. Right, and there were three programs that were funded with um, House Bill 1025, and one of them is a planning grant. Uh, it's $150,000. We can give 12 of those out, and there's a, a pretty pretty tight timeline on that. We have to um, applicants have to submit by October 1, and sorry, November 15th, and we have to make a decision by December 15th. So okay. that means we would have to post an RFA prior to that and go through that process. But we're on track to do that. We have a, a forum that we are jointly doing with the Texas Hospital Association and the Texas Medical Association to introduce the idea to um, hospitals around the state that don't have GME programs. And um, that's, that's planned for the end of next month. There are two other programs that were funded by House Bill 1025. Um, one of them is for unfilled positions, so it's existing GME programs that have approved positions by uh, their accrediting body, but they haven't been able to fill all those positions, and some of that reason, one of those reasons might be funding. So that one um, also has a very even tighter timeline. Those submissions are due October 1 to the coordinating board, and we have to make a decision by January 1 about those. So we're, we're working on that one as well. Um, but that one's a lot easier. We know who has unfilled positions and we can, you know, the communications going out will be easier. Okay. That and answers my question. So thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, the next report uh, or the next item under the uh, Deputy Commissioner's report is our continuous re improvement uh, report. And for that, I call on Dr. Elaine Lang, Director of a Continuous Improvement, uh, to give us a brief presentation. Elaine. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm here to update you on where we're at in our continuous improvement journey. Over the last few meetings, I've been talking to you about our three lean events, which was um, putting all of the um, terminated personnel files from human resources into an electronic content management system, moving all the um, agendas and minutes also into the same type of system and um, was also working with the loan repayment program to simplify the um, scanning and indexing that they do. Today I'm going to be talking to you about lean training. So we've done three lean events. Now we've, we're pivoting to looking at engaging our staff in what is lean and what it isn't. I'd like to um, thank uh, my colleague Debbie Whitus who developed our lean training uh, for this one hour session. So very very simply, it was what lean is and what lean isn't. Um, we wanted people to, here in the agency to understand that lean is about people and it's about processes. And the people who do the work have to be involved in making those processes better. We also wanted them to understand the three main components of leaning a process. Um, it can be eliminating waste, um, and that would be unneeded steps, things that don't add value. But it can also be um, clearing out the unevenness or variation in a process. It can also um, include um, looking at the process and deciding who in that process is overburdened and how do we need to streamline the work so that we're not overburdening certain parts of um, the process or the people. So we've had um, wonderful agency participation. Um, and I have to thank the assistant commissioners, the executive officers, for their support of LEAN. Um, you can see we've had folks from all across um, the agency. We've had folks from our XO level all the way down to our customer service staff in loan program operations in the same sessions. So this was groups of about 12 people, cross-functional, getting together to hear what LEAN is and what LEAN isn't. And so as of today, we've had about 25% of the agency participate in these Lean 101 sessions with future sessions scheduled for July and August. So we've had seven sessions, um, and um, as you know, continuous improvement in Lean is all about surveying people and finding out how this has met their needs. And so we did a very simple online survey, and we've had 52 people respond to that online survey for a response rate of about 78%. 
Um, I briefly showed you, you don't have to look at the details, but we got very candid responses, some very positive, some not so positive, but you can see overall we hover at about the four uh, point level, five being um, it was the best, we loved it, versus one not at all likely. Um, so um, we really feel positive that um, our staff have taken the time to come to the training, but also to give us feedback on the training. I also think it's very important that in our lean events that we model the voice of the customer. And uh, numbers tell a story, but as do um, people's comments. And so what people took away from their Lean 101 session was the conversation across the agency. Um, these are folks who have not normally had a chance to work together um, in teams, and so they had the chance to hear what Lean is, have a conversation about it, but also talk about how they're applying it um, or not in their particular area. We also had to look at what can we can do better in our lean training. And very specifically, people said, you've done three lean events. We want to see what are the methods and what are the results. And we've developed a SharePoint site, an intranet site, where those reports are available for our agency staff. So what is next? Um, we need to move ahead um, in our lean events. And so I want to thank uh, Susan Brown um, for her willingness to look at processes in her area. And I'll be meeting with um, her director, um, Dr. Linda Hargrove, on Friday to look at the research and evaluation process and begin the planning for a lean event in that area. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Julie Laredo for her willingness to um, look ahead. Um, and so I'll be meeting with her staff to look at a lean event event in the P16 area. So this is where we're at today on continuous improvement, and I welcome your feedback. A question. So if you've had 25% participate so far, what's the goal on what percentage of people are going to have participated in a program in total? I, I really believe in the 80-20 um, rule, and if, really, if we only got 20% of the agency, we would have a critical mass to move it forward. So I would love to see it at 40%. Um, we're at 25%. So my goal in the next uh, four sessions in July and August, we'd get to 40% of the agency. Right. Do some of the people go to multiple trainings? or I mean, What are you finding? Is it, they do one or two, or what's the idea? The idea was a one-hour session, um, so you got introduced to the concept. So you just come to one session, and then the further training and the further um, is going to be in the actual lean event. So for me, this training was an opportunity to begin to have dialogues with staff about processes in the areas and begin to line up lean events. Great. Any other questions? Uh, as, as far as the uh, management and supervisory people, have you, have you had 100 percent buy-in? Well, not in terms of attendance at the meetings, um, but I have, I've had many um, XOs come to the meeting. I've had some XOs come to the meetings. I've had um, some directors um, come to the meetings. They still have July and August to attend the meetings. Okay. We have to remember that a lot of the XOs and the directors have been involved in the aftermath of the legislation, Absolutely. legislative session. Okay. So right there is a great example of where some lean process improvement um, would do us some good. Every other year, much of this agency comes to a grinding halt when so many of the staff are consumed and subsumed by the legislative session. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, by, by definition of what you just said, you've, you've identified an area where we should uh, perhaps focus on how can we manage, you know, meet our responsibilities during the session, but uh, manage it in such a way that, it, that everything else or many other important things don't come to a grinding halt. Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, in terms of scheduling lean events, uh, we talked a little bit about this uh, informally, but what uh, is your goal in terms of um, the frequency of events as well as the breadth mm -hmm. of scheduling these? You know, we've looked at the state of Iowa, and they recommend in the beginning years, you definitely want one event per 100 people. So for us, that would be about three events per year. And of course, some of that is given the complexity of working across functional areas. So I would say three to five is what I'm looking at um, for our processes for this coming year. And when are those held? As soon as we, um, we've held most of them in October, right, November. What time of day? 
Oh, they're um, they're scheduled for all day uh, because okay. there's training, and so it would be anywhere from one to three days right. uh, for the processes. Okay. okay. I, I think I would just uh, you, you, every organization has to walk before they can run <clears throat> on, on on embracing this kind of thing, but. Uh, over the course of the year to come, I would encourage uh, your extending uh, your reach, so to speak, by identifying, you know, change champions who could, you know, through the training, plan their own events and then begin to ramp up a number of events. Um, you know, as we were talking earlier, our goal in the early years was to, uh, to have at a, uh, at a plant with fewer people than this agency has one event one four-day event per month. So it, it's doable, it's achievable. But you can't, the same person can't be organizing, facilitating, and leading each event, obviously, <laughs> to, to have that happen. Yes, sir, thank you. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Lane. And this brings us to, to item 3C, which is our compliance monitoring report. I'd like to ask David and Melissa, our two compliance specialists, to come to the presenter's table in case you have, I'm going to present a very brief uh, high-level overview in case you have some detailed questions that they, will, that they are available to uh, respond to that. The report on compliance monitoring for today is divided into two segments. Uh, first, I'd like to report on the three compliance monitoring reviews that, we, uh, that we've done. Uh, and secondly, I will then report on the compliance monitoring plan that we have developed for FY14. The reports on our review of Austin Community College, uh, Brazos Port College, and Palo Alto uh, are included in the materials that we sent you. I'm glad to, and I'm pleased to report that the three institutions generally complied with the rules, the regulations, the statutes, the writers, uh, and so forth related to the report, reporting of enrollment data. However, in all three instances, we, uh, our monitors identified areas for improvement, uh, which we uh, pointed out to them in, in, in the report. We asked them to respond to those areas for improvement and to give us their corrective action plan, uh, which they have done, and it is included in the report under management's response for each one of the respective reports. I'm also pleased to report that I have received several comments on the professionalism of our staff and on the positive reaction and reception by the institutions. As you know, this was our first year where we started going out. We didn't know if we were going to be received kindly or run out of town on a, on a rail. Uh, I think that we, it was the, 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 the first one. So. Uh, in fact, uh, like I said, the, the, the comments that I received were along the lines of thank you for doing this, thank you for coming out, we appreciate the assistance, we appreciate the, the honest and, and, and frank uh, monitoring that you're doing. Uh, so uh, unless, I, I'll be glad or have staff answer any questions on any one of the reports um, that, that, we've, that, that are included in your packet. If not, I'll, let me move to the second part of the agenda of item 3C, which is a presentation of the compliance monitoring plan for FY14. Again, included in your committee packets that, and went out uh, two weeks ago. The plan before you was developed utilizing a risk-based approach. And in my opinion, the plan that, has, that is presented to you today includes a very good mix of institutions that will be reviewed, that we plan to review next year. If you recall, when we presented the plan for the rest of FY13 back in January, uh, Mr. Lalani asked that we make every attempt to include institutions that represent the community colleges, the health-related institutions, the technical colleges, the four years, uh, and the independent schools. In my opinion, again, this plan incorporates uh, all of those, and what we're presenting to you is what I think is a well-balanced, but m very methodical based on the risk uh, factors that, that we use uh, sampling of institutions that we plan to, uh, to visit next year. As you can see, we've got some small schools and some large schools, uh, as well as community colleges and, and some of the other four years. 
Um, and I also want to point out that this plan as presented here includes uh, two more, two additional compliance monitors. Uh, if you recall, the commissioner asked us to find uh, the compliance monitors, uh, the, the FTEs and the money for the compliance monitors a year ahead of the implementation in anticipation that the sunset bill would require us to do that. And in fact, they did. Uh, also, and I will cover this a little bit more detail in, in, when I go through the budget presentation, um, the, the, the legislature not only mandated us to uh, do compliance monitor, monitoring, but they also funded four FTEs and provided the funds uh, for, for a full, full force, full uh, uh, team <laughs> ready to go. And so, so, so the, the number of hours you see here uh, represent uh, the, the four uh, uh, compliance monitors. In other words, we will be looking for two more here pretty soon, uh, and we will release them on the schools uh, as soon as we get them on board. Um, I, I would like to also at this time, uh, even though it's, it doesn't affect the, the carrying out of the compliance monitoring plan, but just so that the board knows, uh, when, when the Sunset Commission rec recommended that we do compliance monitoring, and we started even ahead of time, one of the things that the commissioner asked us to look, uh, to look at, specifically uh, he tasked Mark, our, our internal auditor, and he will cover more of this later on, but le let me just mention this, uh, with uh, doing some research to see where is where should this compliance monitoring section best be located in, in, the, in the agency? Based on Mark's uh, research and on, on some of the best practices that he identified, some of the, uh, 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 the way that some of the other institutions are doing it in Texas and throughout the nation, uh, we recommended to the commissioner that they should report to the internal auditor. However, the census staff uh, had some problems with that. They, they, they said, we think that there's some, in their opinion, conflict of interest and that there is not a chance for uh, that compliance monitoring section to be evaluated because obviously Mark cannot evaluate his own work. But the commissioner came back and says, well, let's, let's see how other entities are doing that. And again, Mark came back and says it can be done with the proper segregation, the proper fences built around the two units. Uh, in fact, uh, one of our biggest institutions, the UT system, has their compliance monitoring under internal audit. And, they, and, and we feel that this is the best place because it leverages the expertise in, in the agency. I don't mind doing it. I don't mind, and I've been uh, I've been uh, uh, doing this, uh, leading this effort for this the, the, for this year. But I, I'm not an auditor. I'm not. I, you know, I've been audited many times throughout my career, and by definition, I think I probably should be an auditor, but I'm not, and I'll be the first one to tell you. And so it just makes sense that we put it under somebody that can manage it, leverage the resources, keep it separate, but nonetheless give it the proper attention that it needs. So that's where we're heading. And, and I gotta tell you, the commissioner feels very strong about this. Uh, we continue to dialogue with Sunset uh, staff. Uh, they continue to express their reservations and we continue to say, we will address them and we are going to address them and we are addressing them. But I just wanted uh, the board to know that that's, uh, that that's where we're heading. So uh, be glad to uh, answer any questions either on our plan or on the reports. <coughs> Uh, well, we have our two compliance monitors uh, here at the table. Arturo, uh, when you say uh, based, on, based on risk assessment, uh, is, is that because of the volume that's related, like in the public universities? We ha why wasn't yeah. it risk assessment University of North Texas or UTEP or how, how did you was it the size of the institutions? Well, I, I think there are several factors. Uh, David, you developed the plan, and you, you so I'm going to let David uh, <coughs> or, or Melissa jump in on that. Could, could you turn your mic on? Pull it closer. 
Is I'm on now. There you I'm David Mahoney, Compliance Specialist. Uh, we used a total of 13 risk factors, primarily things such as uh, the, the, the number and size of grants, loans, uh, enrollment funds, or formula funding funds, uh, previous audits, uh, previous complaints, management concerns, uh, a total of, of 13 in all different risk factors. And then we stratified uh, based on the types of schools. And uh, so, for instance, public universities uh, were approximately 26, 27 percent of the total institutions in the state of Texas. So they got about 26 percent. So then, as far as the selection, whoever rose to the top of the risk assessment in those sections were the ones that we would select based on the overall risk assessment for those uh, different uh, stratifications. So I, I guess my point is, is, is next year, are these going to be the same three universities based on that? Or how, how do we make certain that we're checking the entire system and not just honing in on A&M or UT or, right. or U of H? Another risk factor that will, carries a heavy weight is, is have they been reviewed previously? Okay. And so that's, that's another risk factor. And if they've been reviewed, they would lower down in the, in the risk assessment factors. So that way we can hopefully rotate okay. and get, cover everybody in, in a certain um, a number of years, three, five, something like that. Are all the risk factors weighted evenly? No, they okay. are not weighted evenly. Some are more heavily. The heavier ones would be the, the dollar values. Uh, as, as an auditor, you always go where the dollars are, right? Funny how that works. So, <laughs> so uh, that's, that's, that way. carries a heavier weight than, say, some other ones. Uh, how was the decision made to divide the, the basic division of the pool, a little over two thirds to formula funding and a little less than a third uh, with the uh, financial again aid? that and, and and we tried to get it as close as we could, but we that was based on the, the amount of dollars that are involved. Formula funding is 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 a great deal larger than financial aid in dollars that are out there. So uh, there were a lot of percentages here, you can't get them exactly correct, but most of it, the dollars would are formula funding, so we weighted heavily more heavily on that than we would have on financial so it's, it's roughly proportional. It's roughly to proportional yeah. to the amounts. We, we looked at approximately four billion, five billion in finan uh, formula funding versus about one billion in, in uh, <coughs> financial aid. Any other questions? Okay. Are there any other questions for Dr. Alonzo on any of the other topics? As we stated earlier, these are, uh, they don't require any committee action, but are there any questions while we have uh, the com Deputy Commissioner's report on? That, that, that concludes uh, my, my dep the Deputy Commissioner's report. Okay. All right, we'll move on to agenda item number four, and it's a discussion of the audit of the agency-wide financial statements for fiscal year ended August 31st. First, 2012, by KPMG. Susan Warren, senior partner with the firm of KPMG, and Rebecca Goldstein are here to present this item. And if I can have call on Susan and Rebecca, we welcome you to uh, to visit with us. Thank you. I actually have Rebecca and Phil, and I didn't tell Dr. Alonzo that, so that's my mistake. Apologize, but they're both, hey, Phil. both right there. <laughs> so. So, um, but they are here with me to present. They were the managers on the, on the engagement. So, thank you for the opportunity to present the results of the August 31st, 2012 audit. This is the financial statement on it, the standalone financial statement that you do on behalf of the state. Um, you should have a slide deck in front of you that was delivered to you today, and I'll just walk through that, if you will. On the agenda slide, you'll see we're going to, the responsibilities is just a right, reminder slide, if you will, from, um, the planning meeting we had, I am required just to kind of remind you what you hired us to do, and so it'll be very brief. And then the rest of the slides are really the results of the audit, which is where we'll spend our time. 
So management's responsibilities um, is listed here on the slide, are basically that they develop the accounting policies, they prepare the financial statements that they give us to audit, um, they basically have responsibility for all the control processes and compliance with all the regulations, including the accounting standards, and then make all that available available to us for the audit. And the last item on the slide is at the end of the engagement, they give us a representation letter that they did all those things. And that actual letter they signed is in the formal document you're being handed right now, so it is there for your review if you'd like to see that. And then your as the agency operations committee responsibility is just to oversee that process that we just discussed with a focus obviously on internal controls and the proper tone at the top for the honesty and integrity, the control environment is what we refer to it as. Then what you hired us to do as the external A1 um, financial statement auditors is to put an opinion on that financial statement that your team prepares. And we do that by evaluating controls over financial reporting, which also includes a look at some of the fraud controls and management override. And then if we have any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in controls, we are required to give those to you in writing. And then it does tell you all the different professional standards we are required to comply with. And then we are required to come back at the end of the audit, which is today's presentation, to present the results of that. Any questions on the responsibilities before we move into the actual results? Here you will see what, a very short slide, which is what you want. The word clean, no, and no are the key words on this slide. You have a clean, unqualified opinion. Very good. You have no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies, and there was no adjustments to the financial statements. That is a very good place to be and what you have been achieving to do. So congratulations to the committee and the management team. As far as other items we're supposed to point out is um, all the accounting policies are actually disclosed in the footnotes to the report. They're there for your reading because you do have some options in how you apply certain accounting standards and then you're supposed to tell the readers what those options you have elected to do. The takeaway from this slide is none of those changed from the prior year. There was nothing unusual, no significant changes. So it reads pretty much the same as it did in 2011 which is what you want. You, don't, you actually aren't allowed to be changing policies unless you have some significant internal issue that requires a change. Excuse me. Yes. It, so what you're saying is in, in that particular circumstance, what you're really concerned about is if there had been multiple changes. Absolutely. And in, in, not in compliance with normal right. acceptable accounting standards? Yes, yeah, so you can. Um, consistency is one of the leading kind of things you look for as an auditor is consistency application of policies. It doesn't mean there's not a um, an opportunity where a change is, re is necessary. It just needs to be well thought out and it shouldn't be happening every other year. And so what we look for is consistency in that. And then, you know, there are sometimes the standard setters will say, we want you to do something new. That's not your management team's responsibility. So then we have to say, well, this is how they implemented the new standard. Okay. And so that would be the other thing that might put something on on this slide would be a new standard. Management judgments and accounting estimates. Um, there is a very large one in your financial statements, which I'm sure you're aware of. It's the allowance for doubtful accounts for the student loans and all the related accounts such as interest. Um, your management team does come up with reasonable assumptions about how many people they think might default, what that might look like, collections, judgments, all those things go into those. So what we do is we take a look at those assumptions and make sure they're reasonable based upon other client data, industry standards. Um, we also look back historically. The benefit of an audit is you can kind of look back and actually see if the management's assumptions actually came true or not, how far off they were. So we do a lot of trend analysis. Then we also just take our knowledge of the industry and say, well, you know, this is happening in the industry, so should there have been a change? We also look to see if there, and this is an area where we actually do look to see should there have been a change. But what we found in this is that the allowance methodology was reasonable. This slide shows you what we refer to as other matters, and these are all the other things on the left-hand side, like other information, difficulties, disagreements, consultations, significant issues, written communication, and this basically an other, that if we had these things, we would be required to discuss them today. If you'll notice, they all say none, which means they did not occur during the audit. The first one, other information, that's just a reminder that in the financial statements that you have, there's an MDNA or a management discussion analysis section at the front of the report. There's also what they referred to as a budget to actual schedule on the general fund at the back of the report. Those are information that you put in there with the balance sheet, income statement, and footnotes. We are required to look at that, to read 
read that and make sure it's consistent with the results of our audit. We did that and we found no exceptions to that. And then the other thing on here is a representational note, which I mentioned to you earlier, and it's actually printed for you in the, in the official report you have in front of you. <coughs> Any questions on this information? Okay. Um, the last slide is um, something that you haven't seen before. And if you'll notice at the top, it says verbal comment. We have, Dr. Lonzo and I have talked to you before about verbal comments. We've gotten some questions from you about, well, clean audit's great, but did you find anything else? Yes, we usually do find things that are efficiency-driven comments that we bring to your attention. This year, I have one that I actually chose to put in writing um, based upon our professional judgment. And you're probably asking why. The why is this situation we're about to discuss if it wasn't going to be properly addressed by management, could become a significant deficiency. So part of our professional judgment and our standards is that if we see something that might become an issue, we are required to give that information to you so that you can be aware of that. So that's what this slide is about. Now, I will remind you before we get into the details, you have a clean audit for 12. Okay, so this is not a problem, if you will, from an audit perspective. It's more of an awareness conversation that we are required to have with you. Okay, and so we'll go into what it is and why it wasn't a problem so you can make those links. And please ask questions as we go. The actual point of conversation that we wanted to bring up was the first bullet. Um, we refer to it as control environment, and I'll just read this to you so you can see. But in our dis professional judgment, we saw that there was lack of sufficient action with regard to a resolution process of known business and professional or business and information technology matters. Coordinating board has a process in place, but in our professional judgment, it was lacking effective execution or timely follow up and or engagement appropriate senior management so they could get the right attention. And there were two primary pieces of that, which are the next two bullets. And I'll take each one of those and give you a little bit of background. The first bullet, as read, is manual application of payments for the student loans to reapply automated system postings increased from 11 to 12. That is part of your business process. What, um, what is not part of your business process, though, is that it, the significant increase um, that occurred from 11 to 12 that was quite unexpected. And so um, what that means, why this is important, is unlike other higher education authorities, you have to follow GASB. A lot of other higher education authorities follow FASB. And in GASB, you have, on your financials, you have those columns, and they have different fund names on the top of them. I have to give you an opinion on each column. So when you start talking about manually, manual intervention to reapply loan payments, it's very possible that you could get them in the wrong column, which to an auditor under GASB means something to me. Also, as part of reapplication, it's possible if you don't apply it to the right loan that you would get the wrong interest rate with the wrong principal balance, which interest is a part of the revenue stream in your income statement. So again, another potential issue from an audit perspective. That's why this bullet's important to an auditor. What we didn't find, or why it wasn't a problem, was we worked with management, um, did a lot of extra work, if you will, and um, found that the reapplication was being done in accordance with policy, so it is being done correctly. We found no errors in our very large sample sizes that we chose. Um, we also did some IT work to make sure that the policy was, um, the computer system was basically following the policy correctly. So we were able to work through all of that process and find out that the IT system was doing it right. It did kick out, if you will, a reapplication report where things didn't look right. Your team was reapplying that like they should have, and everything looked fine at the end of the audit. Extra work to mitigate it so it's only a verbal comment, but that's part of what we do. Okay. Questions on point one? So what's the plan for the agency moving forward as far as that addressing that issue so that it doesn't become a, and I guess you call it verbal, but it's written, but it becomes technically a written Written comment. significant deficiency? Mm -hmm. I think Dan has the answer to that question. I figured he might. This is kind of like, you know, if a tree falls in the woods, uh, right. yeah. and nobody's there to hear it, did it make a sound? So. You want to know about this lack of su sufficient action there? So if a little tree falls in the wood, it <laughs> makes a small sound, which I think is where Susan kind of started this off. So 
we identified this last year as an issue, and it was part of the verbal comments last year. It was viewed very um, seriously, and I think that we've we'll, this audit bore that out, and I think Mark will have an audit also on uh, repayments, reposting repayments. But we never really got to the root cause of what was causing the issue until later this year, actually just a couple of months ago. Couple months ago. And I don't want to go into a huge amount of detail, but a little bit of detail I think would is warranted here. So we have various settings within the uh, management system that allows accounts to be classified as being current and then rolling forward their due date into the next month. And there are certain tolerances that we apply that allow that to occur. Our tolerance that we had been using was $2.50. So if I owed $100 and I paid $99, we said, you're current, we're going to roll you forward a month, the next month you owe us $101. Very common practice, um, and it works great if I have one loan. What we have found, and kind of the exacerbation of the issue is that we have many accounts that have 10, 11, 12 loans, and they fall under various columns of funds. So that's Susan's issue is you have to know what's going on at the fund level. So as an individual loan might hit against this pay tolerance and roll forward, it also added the amount of that month's new payment due into the next month, but it didn't necessarily apply that broadly across all of the other loans that existed. So in certain cases, if that occurred in a loan one month and then the next month I won the lottery and I paid $5,000 to my loan, it applied it to the new percentage proportionality based on the new monthly billing. So there were situations, and this is the small, the small trees falling, that this, this was going on and it was identified, but there was essentially the mitigating controls of, well, we don't, you know, when we reapply payments, we're looking at various balances and we don't pay somebody more than what they might be owed as far as a refund might be concerned. So we've identified this particular issue. We've <coughs> essentially taken out that tolerance now. So we don't allow a loan to roll forward on the due date simply because it doesn't work within the breadth of our portfolio and the fact that we are audited on a fund level basis. So we can't afford we can't afford to roll a loan forward because it basically messes up your your next month's payment to the point that it causes problems from an audit standpoint. The, the counting is correct, the system is correct, as Susan has pointed out, but the settings that we have aren't they don't fit within how we need the system to operate uh, for our portfolio. So we've we've removed that tolerance as of. So, so we shouldn't see this in next year's audit then. Well, we're going to the the issue still exists because as loans have to flesh themselves out over time, and it will take a many months potentially for this to flesh out, but it it will continue to be something that we'll have to look at for FY thirteen. For right, sure. Especially because this is July of 13. Yeah, so, so we just we just made this remedy last or just a few weeks ago, actually. So it is an issue we're going to have to, have to look at. Uh, we have various reports that are generated that identify the accounts that this is going on. So we have a very good view of what the what the uh, population looks like. So we have various mitigating controls, and I think we've we've eliminated the cause of the problem, which we hadn't previously done. So that's kind of the important part from your perspective is that you need to know that the, the root cause of what was creating this particular issue, we've, we've fixed. And I think it's going to take, potentially it could take a couple of years to wind through all of the portfolio because it's large. Okay. And all those reports and things he was talking about is the extra IT work and stuff that we did to validate if those reports are working accurately. So it's working. It's not as efficient as you want it to be. Um, 
Is well, it, it actually wasn't. I wouldn't use the word efficient. It was more an, an issue of making sure that the cash that was being received was literally put, being put in the right column of the financial statements. And through this extra work and all these reports where you're being pulled, we could we could actually see that it was. It just um, it didn't go from A to B. It kind of went like this, and we finally found out that it got to B, if you will. It, that's the extra work that had to be done to see that. It's you can't readily see it with that 250 tolerance in the system, you, you can't trace a payment through without a lot of extra work. And that's the extra work we had to do, was to actually see that it got to the right spot. And we didn't have any errors in any of that test work that we did. Any, any other questions, questions for Susan? That's the first bullet, because then we have okay. the second bullet. Yes. The second bullet, um, as written on the slide, policies for terminated new users, periodic reviews, and passwords have not been consistently followed. The takeaway here is that obviously you do have the policies. We say you have them. It's an issue of consistent application. And why that's important to you is obviously those policies are there are for protection of the coordinating board's data, you know, who has proper access to it, all the HIPAA laws and farm laws and all that kind of stuff. Um, and Again, why it wasn't a problem for 12, even though consistently not applied, is we were able to find mitigating factors. For example, let me give you an example. You have an employee who leaves the coordinating board. All of their access should be terminated from both you know, the network, the databases, the applications. We were able to, when we did our test work, we could see that a terminated employer still had access to the Helms application, or application, if you will. However, the mitigating piece was that their network access had been cut off. So they couldn't actually get there, even though it was still, technically they still could log in. They couldn't get there because they didn't have network access. So we were able to do extra work to find out that the mitigating factors kept your access good, i.e., I don't have a significant deficiency, but the policies are not being consistently followed, which Sid and his department are working on correcting. But that's kind of that's an example of how that might work. Another word about the passwords is you have password policies. Um, what we do is make sure you have them and see how stringent they are. And one of the issues we found was that um, you have a policy, but then your system has some limitations. In other words, your policy, you can't do what you want to do with the system because some systems only do certain things. And so Sid and his group are working to align those to make sure that it lines up. So there's just some house cleaning items, if you will. So those policies need to be efficiently followed. And you're satisfied? And you're satisfied that that's being addressed? So it does tell me it is being addressed, yes. We haven't audited that yet, but he, okay. he's working on that. Other questions you might have? Yes, great. Okay, thank, thank you very you, much. Appreciate it, great You're job. Welcome. Thank you, Susan. Mr. Chairman and members, if I may just uh, very briefly state that yes, those are problems and we certainly are working on them and we have every intent of, of uh, <coughs> working through uh, to a resolution, but I, I can't underscore or cannot underemphasize uh, how important this clean audit is to us. Uh, Fred would probably be the only one that, that's here that remembers one of the reasons I'm here is because we were in a situation where uh, auditors almost could not express an opinion because our books were so bad. What Fred may not know is that I almost walked out the week after I got here because the books were so bad. But, but we stayed, but I stayed, and, 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 and seriously, I, I, I really, I want to compliment the staff because they have, they took the challenge. Uh, this is about the third or fourth clean audit with no adjustments, no, uh, uh, no, no adjusting entries and so forth. And this is, this is the culmination of the hard work uh, by the accounting staff and the people in the business office, the loan services, and so forth, uh, that culminates in a clean audit. It happens throughout the year. It's not just a one-time event and we say, okay, let's clean it up for the auditors. We, we try to keep it clean and I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, they are uh, doing a very good job <coughs> and, and I thank them for that. Great job, thank you. Uh, agenda item 5A is consideration of adopting the commissioner's recommendation to the committee regarding the coordinating board's operating budget for fiscal year 2014. Dr. Alonzo will present this item to our committee. The first item for consideration is uh, the FY14 operating budget. 
I'm going to lay out the proposed budget, uh, highlighting some certain, uh, certain uh, pertinent points. And of course, as we go along or at the end, uh, either staff or myself will respond to any questions, any specific questions that you may have. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to point out that as I prepared my presentation for today's, uh, for, for this present, for uh, presenting this budget uh, for next year, I went back and I looked at the format uh, for what I did two years ago in, two, in 2011 after the 2011 session. Uh, and I am pleased to note that compared to two years ago, I have a much more positive and pleasant story to tell. Uh, if you recall, those of you that were here two years ago, uh, and, I, and I saw that in my presentation, I spent the better part of the presentation explaining all the cuts that we, that, that we received, uh, not just in higher ed, but at the agency. Uh, and as I go through the budget for FY14, uh, you will see that instead of reductions and cuts and uh, so forth or elimination of programs, I will be referring to increases, which is it's, it's a good thing. It's, it's, a good, it's a good story to tell. So we can truly state that higher education and the Texas students um, came out as winners from this last session. Before I go into the summary of the budget, and again, I'm going to present a very high level and, and respond to any questions. Let me just, uh, because I think this is important for you to realize uh, how we prepare and manage the budget. Uh, those of you that have worked with me know that I am a big proponent and a firm believer that the divisions are the best managers, the best source to prepare and manage their budget. So we use in this agency what we call a bottoms up approach. With guidance from my office and certain guidance from me, uh, we put out the instructions, we put out the general um, uh, parameters, and then we ask the divisions uh, to submit their proposed budgets to us. Once they do that, uh, David uh, Gardner, Linda Battles, and myself, we get together, we look at it, we have questions, we send it back for adjustments, we uh, ask more questions, uh, they come back, and we review them once again, and once we are satisfied, the three of us are satisfied that it is the best budget, the best use of funds, the best way to budget the funds, we present a, or we make a recommendation to the commissioner. We brief him on it uh, in, in pretty much uh, in, in quite a bit of a detail. And then the commissioner gives us his final approval, which generates the budget that is before you. So um, I, you know, I just think that it's a, good, it's a good process to have bottoms up engagement. Uh, that way they can manage it throughout the year. Also, I, I would be remiss if I did not express appreciation to all the staff, because this effort takes a lot of people uh, to, to get it to where we are. It's a collaborative effort. It's an open process. It demonstrates teamwork. Uh, and a lot of cooperation, and I, I'm grateful for, for staff uh, who work on this budget. So let me uh, present some, uh, some budget highlights. The 14, FY14 budget that is before you is, and I will be referring to page one for, for these figures, uh, totals 811619975 uh, dollars. That is the middle column on that first uh, chart on the second, on the left-hand page of the, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the page. This is 190, almost $191 million more than the FY13 budget. That represents a 31, almost 31% 31 increase from the current year. As you know, or as you would have uh, seen uh, in, this, in this budget that we propose to you, there are two main components of our budget. Number one, operations, which are the fun funds that are used for the administration of the agency. And trustee funds, which are funds that are trusted in, in, in the, the language of the state to the coordinating board for us to distribute to institutions, students, or other entities, uh, often referred to as pass-through funds. The FY14 budget breaks down into, and again, I am I'm going over the information on page one. The operating budget, almost $28 million, $27.7 million, which represents 3.4% of our total budget. And our trustee funds, 
783, almost 784 million dollars, which is almost 97 percent of the budget. Also, on the right-hand side of the page, again, still on page one, you will see that we take the same budget, uh, the same figures, and break them down by what we call uh, sources of funds or method of finance. Uh, ours consists of general revenue and all of the funds lumped together. Uh, obviously, in our detailed budget uh, uh, documents, we break, it, we break those other funds uh, to exactly, ex exactly what, where they come from. But for this purpose, uh, I just want to know that 57 percent of our operating funds, uh, of our operating budget, our total budget, is funded by general revenue. Another way of looking at this is that of the total GR appropriations to the coordinating board, which is uh, $728 million, $728.2 million, um, only two, approximately 2.2 percent of that goes to our operations, in other words, the administration of the agency. The majority of those funds come to us and are passed on to the schools and to other entities. So with, with that kind of an administrative overhead, if you will, if a one way of looking at it, I would submit to you that the state, uh, that we're giving the state a good, a good uh, bargain uh, here at the coordinating board. The proposed budget uh, before you funds a total of 258 full-time equivalencies, or as we refer to them, FTEs. This is 17 under our cap, but even though we are 17 under the FTE cap, uh, the budget limitations restrict us to the 258 that are budgeted in here. Uh, however, those 17 FTEs that uh, gives the agency some flexibility to seek and obtain external funds and be able to staff appropriately as needed, even though that in the coming biennium that becomes less of a problem because I believe that we have a rider that exempt us from counting any externally funded positions in our FTE cap. So, but, but even if we didn't have that, we, we are okay because we, we have a uh, flexibility of 17 uh, for, for next year. Also included in the total FTE count uh, that I just uh, enumerated for you are the four additional FTEs that are provided uh, for funding of our compliance monitoring section that I uh, alluded to earlier in, in, the, in the report. And I believe that was one additional FTE uh, for the implementation of a primary care innovation grant program, uh, and, and it added another FTE. So both of those were funded what they call through contingency riders, and so they added those to our, to our FTE count. As mentioned earlier, the state funding increased significantly from the current biennium. Uh, which you, you see there on page one. This budget represents the first year appropriation for those increases, uh, which this board has been briefed on by uh, the ER staff at, at the committee last time, and I believe you are scheduled to receive another briefing on, on that tomorrow. No, we're not, okay. Uh, well, but, but, but we, have, we have put that information out. Uh, so I'm not going to go through every one of them, but let me just point out some of the what we think or what I think are some of the most significant. Uh, first of all, you know that the priority of the coordinating board when we submit our LAR, at least it has been since I've been here since 2007, the first priority is to always ask for an increase in Texas grants. We feel that Texas grants is. Uh, very much a needed program, and we felt that we were falling behind as the legislature either left our funding uh, intact or, as in the case of last biennium, cut it by 10 percent. Well, this year, our Texas grant funds were increased by 25 percent. So for the biennium, this is a biennium figure, so what you're seeing here is only the first, first year of the biennium. Uh, we have $724.6 million in Texas grants. And that's significant because coupled with some of the recommendations that the commissioner has made to the schools to try to expand or try to uh, reach as many students as we can, uh, we feel that we will reach about 84 percent of needy students, which is significant because otherwise we would be falling behind and, and, and certainly uh, far behind in closing the gaps. 
the Texas Opportunity, the Texas uh, TEOG, which is the uh, funds that go for uh, community colleges, uh, was increased uh, from $23.5 million last biennium to $27 million, a 20% increase. TEG, which is the state's contribution or the state's uh, funding of scholarships for students uh, going to the uh, private institutions, increased by 7%. Texas Be On Time, increased by 5%. Texas Work Study, increase of 6%. That's a small amount. I mean, the, the amount that, that they fund for uh, work study is small, but nonetheless, it, it did receive an increase. The Teach for Texas program uh, received, uh, after it being slashed almost to nothing, I think it was slashed to $1 million in the last biennium, received an appropriation of $4.4 million. So that was, that, that was a, a very, very huge increase in terms of percentage. Uh, so the, the point here is that last two years ago, as I went through those programs, I was telling you how, may, how much each one of those were cut. Now it is really good, it feels good for me to tell you how much they were increased. In addition to the increases in financial aid, the legislature granted increases for graduate medical education, including a $5 million increase to the family practice residency program, uh, 28.1, again, this is biannual figures, 28.1 million dollar increase in the physician education loan repayment program, 4.1 for the professional nursing shortage reduction program, 4.1 million increase, uh, 16.3 for increase for graduate medical education expansion, uh, and 3.2 for increase in the joint admission, or as we call it, the JAMP program. Also, there are a couple of new strategies that are funded, and you will see those uh, if you would uh, go to page um, three, three and four, uh, up to over to on the left-hand side, right under the goal, uh, we've identified uh, the new programs. Two that I want to point out is $2.7 million for the University of North Texas Health Science Center College of Pharmacy. I believe those funds were trusted to us and we're tasked with ensuring that there's a certain enrollment that is met before we release those funds. Uh, the, the other one that is new is $7.8 million for the UTB, which is the University of Texas at Brownsville, slash Texas Southmost College Transition Funding. And um, I, I'm glad Susan's here because if you have any questions on that, she will be glad to answer. Those are two of our new uh, strategies that were funded. On page three of your document, uh, the, the same one that we're on, you will also notice that the strategy for Texas grants, uh, which is the first entry on that page, uh, reflects a $30, $30 million of non-general revenue funds. This reflects the generous contribution from TG for our Texas grant program. TG will also contribute, and you will see that down um, about halfway down the page, uh, $2.9 million for the T-STEM Challenge Program uh, reflected on that same column. Similarly, you will also notice a $1.5 million in that same column in non-general revenue for the Physician Education Loan Repayment Program. This represents the second contribution from the St. David Foundation uh, to fund this very important program. And on behalf of the students, and I know that the board will join me in publicly thanking both TG and the St. David Foundation for their interest and their generosity in helping Texas students. If there's one area of concern regarding our budget, it is that the legislature did not provide IT capital funding for the second consecutive biennium. This is troubling to me and to us here that, uh, that manage this because for four years, we will have no funds to replace our aging equipment. And as we know, a failure to replace obsolete equipment will eventually take its toll on productivity We're, and, and, and on the responsiveness of our staff. Uh, we are managing the best we can. We, you know, scrape and try to find whatever we can and wherever we can, uh, and, and and we'll continue to manage that as we. Uh, but I do want to I do want to state that it is a concern. Another concern is that that I have, and we're working through it, is that there was legislation that was passed that allows the board members to participate in board meetings from remote locations. 
this is good legislation. It's, it's an efficient and it's, it's, it's something that will help the efficiency and certainly uh, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing the legislation. Uh, what I am concerned about is that uh, the legislation that allows that participation is very prescriptive as to what they should see on the other side and what we and the audience should see on this side. And the, the reason that it's a concern to me is that we don't have the equipment to comply with the nuances of that legislation. I have tasked our IT group, uh, and they're working on it, to take a look at exactly what it would it take for us to be in compliance if we want to move, and I'm sure we will want to, or have to at some point, uh, to be in compliance with that law. And they are looking at that, they are going to come back to me with a report, and we hope that Again, whatever they come up with, obviously cost considerations is going to be a very big part of that report, uh, that we can have something to you by January. So we're working on it, but, but I, I have to say that you know, we, we were concerned uh, with, with both those items. So when, when Durga was um, videoed in I don't know, a couple of months ago or last year, I lose track. From India? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so... Did that not meet the requirements, or would, did, that, did that technology not come up to snuff? I mean, it seemed to have worked reasonably well. Well, yes, and I believe uh, we use Skype, uh, and Sid uh, may, may be able to throw some more light on this, but under the existing law, and, and we've been working with our general counsel because it's very, like I said, it's very prescriptive. Um, I mean, in fact, I believe the law says that the, the person on the other end is supposed to read the change in tone and demeanor of the persons on this end. I don't think Skype does that. Uh, Sid, uh, is that stated correctly? Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Uh, there's actually two pieces of legislation, 2414 and uh, 984. And one of them permits you know, participation from a remote location. Uh, with Durga in the last meeting or whatever it was, we used Skype. The problem with that is we could all see him. He could not see all of you. All we had was a broad view of the, uh, the dais. So what is required by the second piece of legislation is that you be able to see the nuances of the individual, the facial expressions or whatever. Uh, the other part of the second legislation requires that if there is a problem with the connectivity and it breaks down at some point, you have, I think it's six hours to repair it. Otherwise, the meeting has to be postponed. So, as you can imagine, we wouldn't want to be in that situation. Um, I guess, you know, we're looking at various options, various price ranges, and come back with some options for Dr. Alonzo and the, uh, the board. You know, there's got to be a practical solution. Um, my th three-and-a-half-year-old grandson talks on FaceTime to his dad right. from another state on an iPhone. I mean, come on. Uh, this well, is there's, there's definitely solutions out there. Yeah, I know none, that none wide angle view is a, is a you know a difficulty, but you know if we if we just set up you know the requisite number of iPads with FaceTime and you know turn that on uh, and, and well, the problem with uh, some of these screen. things like Skype, for example, you're very dependent on what the person has at the other end, mm -hmm. and we have no control over the other end. Yeah, we can control this environment here, but we can't control what the individual is using at the other end, who their ISP provider is, things well, like the, that. So. The connectivity issue, uh, you know, is all you can do is say, here's what you need. But, I mean, if, if it's um, that critical, you know, uh, you have uh, every board member, give, you know, has a, an iPad just for coordinating board communication and... Uh, uh, an email address and FaceTime, and it's on uh, 3G, so you're not relying on the internet. And uh, you know, FaceTime in. Yeah. Well, there's other implications as well. For example, if you have a third party on the agenda making a presentation from a remote location, again, you have the same requirements that people can interact and see that person, and he can see you, and so on. So there's a lot of other implications that we need to look at. Well, I get the sense that the legislation was looking. Uh, to prevent, you know, use of practical technology. Uh, so, I can't speak know, for the legislature. Where there's a will, there's a way. And the question is, can we, can we, uh, 
you know, implement the will to do this. Well, uh, we are talking to DIR because obviously this is going to be an issue for all the agencies. And so shared uh, services is another thing we should be looking well, at. Well, what DIR is doing, they've actually issued an RFP looking at providers of uh, video conferencing capabilities, and they'll probably come up with a list of providers. It doesn't solve our problem entirely, but at least it'll provide us with a list of providers at a reasonable rate, hopefully a reasonable rate, that we can uh, perhaps enlist what, the providers. What about sharing the services with other agencies? And, and well, that's another option. Or? I mean, when we met with DIR, they said we always have the option of holding your board meetings at another facility, that another agency that has that kind of facility, but I don't think that would be a very practical in terms of, you know, you'd be the second second in line for that particular day or whatever, so. Um, but again, I, th I think there are options out there. Hopefully we can find some. The costs keep coming down. The technology keeps getting better, so we'll come up with some options. It's kind of ironic. They, the legislature says you need to provide this technology, but on the other hand, they don't give us any money in capital budget to do anything, so it creates some challenges, but we'll do the best we can. Did, did the legislation prescribe a timeline to accomplish uh, well, this? Well, it's, uh, it's September 1st, okay, uh, nice. but it doesn't say you have to do it. It's ultimately up to the board to decide whether they want to do it or not. Oh, okay. But if we want to have members participate remotely, then we have to provide that facility. And, and their guidelines are pretty darn prescriptive as to how this process needs to look. Exactly. And I assume that they put some real good thought into that, but seems to be pretty pretty detailed right okay. we'll, we'll do the best we can great thanks thank you what, 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 and i'm assuming this is on the same line sid uh we're talking about old and and uh, computer equipment and technology and that sort of thing in your best estimation you know how long are we going to be able to get by without being able to update <laughs> that that, that's I mean, a challenge. You know, I'm not, I mean, in all seriousness, yeah, the technology is changing so quickly. There may be uh, some computer programs that, that are available, like in the loan, the Helms or whatever, that, uh, that won't run on our equipment. And then that's obviously the concern. It's not just the productivity if a computer is slow or crashes. It's also the ability to run new operating systems, right, absolutely. run new versions of software. And uh, by the end of this next biennium, we could have some people with computers that are eight years old. And obviously, we had been on a four-year refresh cycle before the current biennium, so we replaced one quarter of our computers every year, and that's been impossible for the last two years, and will be impossible for the next two. Again, there, though, we're looking at options such as leasing computers. Uh, we're also looking at thin client technology, uh, and I don't want to get technical, but uh, those are options which perhaps could reduce the amount of cash that we need to set up something. There's still going to be a cost, though. So. Thank you. Arturo, we don't have the um, flexibility in the budget to take the cost of five of those extra t FTEs and shift some money to hardware doing? We do, but it's very limited. I believe it's $100,000 a year. Yes. Um, it's difficult to transfer funds from operation to capital items. Uh, we can use operating funds to purchase capital equipment, but the limit is 100,000 in each category. For example, we could buy 100,000 of PCs. Yeah. Well, that's a few. That's a little, yeah. uh, and it helps. And right. so we, and that's, those are some of the things that I mentioned we're working on. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Sid. Uh, one more item uh, or one more point on the, on the budget, uh, and I uh, conclude with this, and I think it's a positive note. Uh, the legislature provided funds for a 1% salary increase for all state employees in FY14 and 2% increase in FY15. When this came out, the commissioner asked the leadership of the agency to find a way to double that FY14 salary increase. Uh, make, in other words, make it a 2%. Uh, working with uh, Comptroller and the LBB, we didn't know if we could that, do that or not, but we did receive permission to add an additional 1% to the states across the board mandated increase. And so, you know, we work with the, with the division heads to make sure that they identify that in their budget, and, uh, and they have. 
So, and this is, this is significant, even though some people may say, well, you know, 2% is not, not that much. Uh, it's significant because state employees have not received a statutorily provided increase since the 2008-2009 biennium. So as small as it is, it's appreciated and it is uh, as a small token for, for the hard work. Uh, that concludes my presentation on the budget, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, and I would be glad to uh, respond to any questions. Janelle? Oh, so I, I'm, I'm sure you've probably explained this before, but tell me why Baylor College of Medicine is, has its own separate, you know, division versus UT Southwestern and all the other state medical schools. The, and, and I can only tell you from anecdotally what I have heard when this was set up. Baylor College of Medicine, as you know, is a private institution. And so they cannot receive state funds directly. And state funds that they do receive have to come through us. Okay, I don't know if that's what you're asking. If you're asking why do they receive state funds at all, this is where the anecdotal uh, information that I have comes in. I understand that at one time the legislature decided that it was cheaper to fund certain spots at the private schools than to build new medical schools. Uh, and so that's how Baylor College of Medicine ended up getting uh, their appropriation. So, so I assume there was legislation that provided that. So do we provide 100 percent of their? No, no. Or a, a percentage, it, or just whatever we feel like? No, no, what, what the legislature uh, appropriates to us, which is about $80 million, uh, Susan. So uh, so every every year the state? Uh, biennium. Biennium, well, yeah, every year. It's about $70 million a biennium. $70 million. So the, the, turn your mic on, please. So my question is, do, does Baylor come to the legislature and say, okay, this year we need a hundred million there is to a get formula, by? There's a formula set up in statute, and mm -hmm. it looks at the amount per student at, that is being funded at UT Southwestern mm -hmm. and the amount per student that is being funded at UTMB Galveston, and it's the average of those two, and that's how much. So they have to enroll that number of Texas students into their medical school to earn that amount of money. So it's, it's all in formula spelled out in statute. Okay. So then what percentage is state money? Do they have their own private they money? Ha they have their right. own so private what, money and right. their own budget and all of so that. So what do we know, just curious, of their total on that, of what you said was 70? I, I would have to get that for you because that's the biennial, 70 right. million a biennium. I'd have to get that. We get their annual financial report. I just don't have it on the top of my head. But it is a percentage. It's a very, it's probably about the same percentage. They still have patient care income right. and all that that our regular health science centers have. This has uh, been in place since the 1950s? Before my time. <laughs> <laughs> since it's now I've been here a long anecdotal. time, but I haven't been here that long. I must be. <laughs> You're welcome. Any other questions? Arturo? All right, so um, we need to have a motion to adopt the operating budget. So we second. Janelle, second Harold. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you very much. Agenda item 5B is consideration of adopting the commissioner's recommendation to the committee regarding a request to extend the contract for the Helm Student Loan Software Annual Usage and Support Fees for fiscal year 2014 with a total for the year not exceeding uh, $1,250,000. Dr. Alonzo will present this item to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This item seeks your approval for a one-year renewal of the existing software for the administration of our loan program. The 10-year contract, which was initially entered into back in 2006, provides for, well, for 10, for 10 uh, renewal options and this will represent the seventh year of that contract. The present contract includes an annual usage fee of $578,000 plus an additional cost of five basis point for the portfolio balance over $850 million. As of May 31st of this, this year, the software manages a portfolio of approximately $1.17 billion. We are requesting approval for a not to exceed amount 
of $1,250,000 based on our best estimates for FY14. We've had questions that have been raised about the costly nature of this contract, and for that very reason, we have an agenda item in a few minutes that will seek your authority to issue a competitive solicitation for software to replace uh, the one that we're asking you to renew right now. However, the identification of, of other existing products, the negotiation, the implementation, and so <coughs> forth, will be timely, maybe a year or two down the road. Uh, so in the meantime, we need to manage our loan portfolio, so we respectfully request your approval of this renewal uh, for FY14. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you, Harold, for the motion. The second, Janelle. All in favor of the motion to renew the, uh, the agreement, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Right. Thank you. Uh, just we are looking at other programs. Okay. Yes, we'll present that in, in a second here. here. Yes. Moving on to agenda item uh, 5C is consideration of, adopt, of adopting the commissioner's recommendation to the committee to approve a renewal of the interagency contract between the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board and the Office of the Attorney General for the litigation and collection of delinquent student loans for the 2014-2015 biennium. Dan, we will present this item to the committee. Dan. First, let me thank Arturo for taking that previous agenda item. <laughs> so we entered into a IAC with the Attorney General's office in fiscal year 2010. So we're in our, this will be our third um, renewal of that agreement. Uh, this contract amount is essentially unchanged from the current uh, fiscal year. We're running about $590,000 a year. Uh, what this does for us is it essentially funds FTE positions that are at the OAG's office that collect on our defaulted student loans on our behalf. Uh, it's worked out quite well from our, from our perspective, our collections over time, and I think Sharon has a, a, a non-ER approved uh, spreadsheet. So it's a little bit on the crude side because Dom hasn't edited it. But the last couple of years, we've collected on the order of six and a half million, I think, in fiscal year 13. We're on track to collect about seven and a half million in fiscal, I'm sorry, six and a half in 13, 12, seven and a half million in 13. And I think the key part, part of this particular uh, slide is our previous trends before we entered into our agreement with the OAG, we were trending down uh, we were not collecting as much as we should have been collecting, which was the reason that we entered into this agreement in the first place. So we are very, we are very happy with how this particular agreement is going. We have a very close working relationship with the, the folks at the OAG, and I would ask that you approve this particular agenda item, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. We have a motion to... Uh to adopt a renewal of the interagency contract between the coordinating board and the office of the AG. We have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Yep. Agenda item 5D is consideration of adopting the commissioner's recommendation to the committee to issue a solicitation for selection of a new software solution to replace the board's Helms loan management system with a new loan management system. Dr. Alonzo will present this item to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For this item uh, and, and, and the next one, you have a corrected uh, agenda uh, material, a blue, what we call the blue page, and it's inserted in your book. Uh, it's a small technical correction. Uh, initially, I believe we had asked for permission to issue an RFQ, and uh, working with general counsel, uh, we changed that to just the generic term of a solicitation, we will decide what kind of solicitation we will get to that point. So I mentioned this item already when I presented, you, presented the previous item to you, so I'll try not to be repetitive. But I do want to say that staff in the loan program area, the business office, and the IT staff have been working hard, been working together, and been working hard to identify the requirements for a replacement software program for our loan 
uh, operations. And I'm not going to go into too much detail. In fact, I'm not going to go into any detail because we're still developing that. But I would like to say that I have reviewed over 13 pages of the detailed requirements. And if approved, our solicitation will be very comprehensive. Uh, and, and this is important so that we obtain a replacement program that will meet our needs. We don't know what's out there. We don't know what's going to come back. But it's a very necessary step, as, as uh, Mr. Hahn has already uh, alluded to. Uh, and and it's, it's something that uh, we want to be thorough and comprehensive, and we are. And so with your permission, with your approval, uh, we request to, uh, to, to issue the competitive bid and see if we uh, can find a product that is better, faster, and hopefully cheaper. So move. Let me ask you a question. So, what's what's our time frame on this? I, you know, renew the other contract. We, we yeah, we, we have uh, we have next year right. to, to go through this, and then we have, I believe, three more options. If, if if for some reason we find something or we took longer, so we still have the helms, right? But we just have, would have to keep renewing. Them. I guess I'm just wanting to make sure that you know. That process takes a good bit of time, and from when you make a decision and to where it's actually implemented, you know, do you, does that roll you into another year with the current agreement, or, you know, are you is it a, is it a relatively smooth, quick, efficient transition to the other system? I, I don't think it is, but I let Dan. Uh, Sounds like it wouldn't be. I don't think it will be. Smooth and smooth and quick, I think, is not not on our horizon. Too optimistic. Okay. Uh, we're fully, we're expecting to finish our work on preparing the solicitation in the next few weeks. And then we have various steps we have to go through from a state um, contracting perspective. Okay. Uh, I would fully expect to take six months to get responses back and vet them through the process and select and identify what could p potentially be more than one supplier. We're looking at not just software solutions. We're looking at outsource solutions. We're looking at anything potentially that is better, faster, you know, cheaper for, for the portfolio itself. Many of those steps are going to require some subsequent board action, I would suspect. Uh, I would also suspect that the conversion cost would be substantial. And usually, uh, you know, we have certain guidelines within our appropriations allow us to spend loan funds. This may exceed some of our appropriation authority, in which case we may have to go back to the legislature, depending on what kind of product that we end up deciding to select. So it's, I, it's going to be complicated, and I would expect that it's going to take a year to get on board with something and likely to be another year in transition. Uh, we'll. I think the, this morning's meeting, there was a chart about, you know, you're going to spend more money and then save money in the long run. I suspect that that would be the case for this as well. Okay. Well, that, that helps clear it up. I mean, we're going to be doing this. We'll be hearing a lot more about this as we go. You'll be hearing, um, if not in October, you'll definitely get an update in October where we're at. You'll likely get another update in January. I want to kind of emphasize something Arturo touched on. You know, we have a, a staff of folks now that are working on this, and it's the meetings are very large. There's a lot of people that have a vested interest in making sure that it works correctly. Uh, we have a we have a team in place now that we probably didn't have in place a few years ago that have the technical skills and the business acumen to pull something like this off and to do it well. So I guess from my perspective, you know, the pieces are in place now to do this well. So I think this is the, you know, from a timing standpoint, this is exactly the time that we need to be looking at this, and I think we'll be able to move as quickly as we possibly can. What we find on the other side of the door, however, is still, still to be determined. Okay. One thing, Bobby, is, and while we certainly don't want to drag our feet on this, uh, we've we got to also guard against moving too fast and end up with something that doesn't do what we are wanting it to do. So that's what I meant by comprehensive and thorough. Good. So we have a motion to adopt the solicitation for the selection of a new software solution to replace the board's Helms Loan Management System. All in favor of the motion and second say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Agenda item 5E, 
is consideration of adopting the commissioner's recommendation to the committee to issue a solicitation for selection of new software solution to support the litigation and collection efforts on defaulted student loans. Dan will also pre present this to the committee. I'll be, I'll be brief, hopefully, as well on this. This is actually a subset of the solicitation that we just previously talked about. So as part of the larger solicitation is a component about litigation support. And currently, the Helm system was never designed, nor does it have the capability to manage uh, litigation. And the OAG's office within our world doesn't have a very uh, large capability in that regard as well. So we are looking to essentially provide or look at what's available from a loan management system that's really tailored towards default collection, post-litigation collection. So it's, a, it's really a subset of the previous solicitation. It's much smaller. We wanted to be going off in essentially two different directions. We didn't want this one to get bogged down in the scale of the first solicitation. So we're expecting this to go much quicker. It's much, we're expecting it to be much less expensive because we're not originating, we're not doing other kinds of student loan servicing. It's more geared towards litigation uh, capabilities and litigation functionality. <clears throat> Any questions? Any motion to adopt the solicitation for selection of new software to support the litigation and collection efforts on defaulted student loans? Second, Janelle. Chris, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Dan. Agenda item 5F is consideration of adopting the committee's recommendation to the board relating to the report on financial aid for college students in Texas, fiscal year 2012, House Bill 1, General Appropriations Act, Rider 31, page 352, 82nd. Texas Legislature. Tan Weaver and Jane Caldwell will present this item to the committee. I think I gave Jane. Or maybe Dan will just present this I think I gave Jane a pass in case y'all ask hard questions. <laughs> so do y'all have a copy of this in front of you? This is, the, this is the summary of the report that we submit. There's actually about 150 pages of appendices that are also attached to this a couple of years ago. To save the earth, we stopped printing all 199 pages of the report. We provide you the summary, and then we make the PDF of the file available, and you can look at all of the institutions that, that are near and dear to your heart as to how they get various forms of financial aid. I will, if you wouldn't mind, opening to page two and three, there are a couple of summary points that I think are, are pertinent. I won't go through the whole report. I would encourage you to go through the whole report because it gives you a pretty good snapshot of our student population, the various forms of financial aid that are available to them. And when we have policy discussions with regard to financial aid, the database that we usually work from is this particular database that creates this particular report. So as the Policy Institute has various recommendations, this is the database that they use to craft to do their work, essentially. So just real quickly, on figure one, the, it goes through the various forms of financial aid, and obviously the state of Texas is very heavily dependent on loans. This is fiscal year 12. Fiscal year 12, almost $5 billion of loans were issued to students, about $4 billion of grant aid, and a, a very tiny sliver of work study. And then on the second bullet point on the top of page two, 904,000 students in Texas apply for need-based financial aid of some type. So I think the percentage figure is 61% of students in the state are getting some kind of need-based financial aid. And as we look at various policy discussions that, that you uh, weigh in on, you know, the, the we have students that aren't in the financial aid database, and typically they either either they have not applied for financial aid or they don't have they have sufficient resources that they don't need financial aid. But we have a very very large population that depends on financial aid in order to attend higher education. So many of the policy discussions that we're having 
is it's richer because we have so much data on such a large percentage of our student population. So I just wanted to point that out. On the next page on figure two uh, is the segregation between federal institution, the state and other. Obviously with the federal loans and the Pell Grant program, the bulk of our financial aid that's, a, that's uh, used by our students comes from the federal government. Second to the institution and then other and then the state funds actually is the least uh, the least amount, is that even a correct phrase? Fred, is that a correct phrase? Least amount? Least amount. I don't know what's coming out of your mouth. <laughs> Good point. So again, as, as we have discussions regarding state financial aid policy, it's a it's relatively, relatively small subset of the greater uh, picture for students in the state. And I'm really going to, I'm going to stop there. If somebody has specific questions about the report, its structure, it's really des designed to be a data dump <laughs> for legislators. We do have certain legislators that actually look at this report, which is encouraging, uh, primarily to see where the money goes. And the appendix actually shows where the money goes for each particular program that's reported. And if the questions are really hard, I'll have Jane come up. What what uh, what is it looking like as far as the federal aid? It, considering budget situations, are are we looking at that flat to down to? I think the I think the flat. I think the preservation of Pell grants and the dollar value that they have previously been held at is going to hold true. Uh, the federal loans obviously has been in the news lately with the changing in, changing interest rate for the subsidized loans. Uh, we get updates periodically about the new, you know, there's a new deal being brewed in, uh, in Congress about looking at what, what the interest rate should be. And I think there's, there's lots of compelling arguments on both sides now that it should be lower. The federal loan rate should be lower across the board, not just for subsidized loans. Whether they actually do something or not, usually, usually the conversation ends with it's not likely that they'll do something because they're not prone to doing anything at the federal level. Uh, this particular one seems to have some momentum around tying the loan rates to 10-year Treasury bills plus, plus up on certain percentages depending on what the loan type is. So you can see over the horizon if this goes through, uh, a federal loan would be at 3.5% on the order, which currently they're at 6.8. So it would be a very good deal next year for students, but then it's got built-in escalators through 2017 to the point that it's higher than the current 6.8 percent. And uh, just as a reminder, the state's loan program is at five and a quarter percent. So I, you could very easily see that, you know, federal loans would become a better deal than the, than the state loan in the short term, uh, depending on loan availability. There are still limits on the federal loan about how much you can borrow. I don't know that, uh, Mr. Hahn, I don't know that there were any other federal changes with regard to EFC calculation change. That tends to change the mix of dollars that goes. I don't think that there's anything on the horizon for that. And higher ed authorization is probably the next opportunity to make substantial changes. And I think that's, most people think that's going to happen in 2015. Well, my, my thought is, is that even though <laughs> $566 million is a lot of money. If the feds cut their program, it's certainly going to have a very dramatic impact on closing the gaps. You got to have more money. <laughs> it certainly hurts. Uh, it hurts a university student probably more than a community college student. Um, the zero EFC students, the general, you know, the, the information I read, zero, zero EFC, meaning they have no, you know, according to the federal government, they have no, uh, uh, they have no financial resources to attend. Um, they want to preserve zero EFC, you know, they want to preserve dollars to zero EFC students. And then as, you know, as the incomes increase or the expected family contributions increase, you taper. So you would, you know, adjust your taper rates to save money. 
So then, you know, the you know, kind of squeezing in on the middle class students will probably start to proliferate within the federal thinking because it's a logical thing to do. You know, you have to preserve preserve dollars for the neediest students, and then the students that don't have, don't have financial constraints, you don't really worry about them so much. And then the person in the in the center is the one that's going to get squeezed. And those are the middle income students that don't get they kind of run out of grant aid and institutions start moving their money down the EFC chart to the point where these folks aren't getting anything and they're borrowing exclusively. Right. Good report. You can see that in the chart on page four. Janelle? Yeah. Page nine, I was just looking at the financial aid by students home, uh, but it, in there, you, uh, this is federal money and state money combined. I'm sorry, you're on page nine? Page nine. Yes. So the comment in there, the balance of funds when approximately 101,000 aid recipients from other states and countries, that would be federal money, right? We don't give state money to um, students from... I think there are, we also include exempt, exempted and waived students. And how do you get to do that? They report to the coordinating board. I, I mean, if I'm a student, if I'm a Louisiana student that's attending a Texas institution on a waiver, they're going to be in the financial aid database. So they could get Texas tax dollars to go to school? Uh, they generate formula funding just like any other student at that particular institution. They're not getting, they're not getting okay. state grant aid. That's what, that was my clarification. Okay. Thank you. But they are reported in the... They could be reported in the financial aid database. But they're paying out of state tuition is what? Not necessarily. Okay. You know, a lot of the border institutions have reciprocal. Oh, the border. I see what you're saying. Waivers <laughs> allow certain students to pay in-state tuition and fee rates. But this is an area that has uh, got a lot of attention in 2011. And uh, just coincidentally, there was some discussion in this morning's Council on Continuous Improvement about the number and, more importantly, the total dollars going into waivers and exemptions. It's significant. It, and has that increased it, a, a great deal? Oh, yeah. The dollars have increased as tuition and fees have increased. Certain, had, certain programs have increased greatly. Dual credit is one that's increased greatly. The Hazelwood exemptions. Would, Hazelwood exemption. Was, and I guess for y'all's purposes, since we're having this little conversation, I guess exemption is you know, good, bad exemptions are typically thought of as being bad financially for the institution because they're not getting tuition and fee revenue from those particular students. Now, not that they don't deserve the benefit that they're getting, but there's no <coughs> dollars flowing. Waiver is not necessarily the case because they're getting, they're getting dollars and cents from those students at the in-state rate. So they're getting some funds from those students. And in many institutions, there's a great benefit for them to have those students on their campus, primarily because they do generate tuition and fee revenue. So does the legislature put in, uh, write the exemptions and waivers, or the staff does, or the board does? Chapter 54, and I would encourage you to read Chapter 54 of the code. Okay. which talks about tuition and fees, exemptions and waivers, and there's never been an exemption that a politician didn't like, and then they hate it when they approve it, and then for years and years later, as the costs associated with a particular exemption rise, then they complain about it. But it's hard to take away a benefit from a deceased firefighter's kid. Right? Well, I'm more concerned about foreign countries and, you know, Oklahoma. Um, <laughs> Which is a foreign country, I might add. I would take that, you sinners. <laughs> well, and, and waivers, again, waivers generally from an institutional standpoint are not, they are not a bad thing. So I, that's the, the disconnect from a policy standpoint is you can argue the dollars and cents of a waiver, but when you really get down into the weeds of a waiver, it's the, none of the institutions are going to come out and, and go be against a waiver because they are generally thought to be beneficial to their campuses. Even if, even if it's costing money? Oh. Well, for instance, uh, one wa waivers are used to attract graduate teaching assistants. Sure. Uh, as an example. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, most waiver, I guess, the graduate teaching assistants, <laughs> scholarships, competitive scholarships are the two biggest. Well, scholarships are, you know, normally based on merit or. Uh, there are requirements for the waiver for a scholarship, mm -hmm. but it allows institutions to recruit wherever they want to recruit, either Oklahoma or Korea to get a student to attend that particular campus, and they do get tuition and fee revenue from those students. Last time we looked at this, the order of magnitude was there were over 200 exemptions and waivers? Is that uh, right? Or is that no, the, I think it's 56, 58. Of, in which case? 60, 60 different programs. The number of students, perhaps, might be in the hundreds of thousands, and the dollars are in the hundreds of millions. So, the exemptions and waivers combined are 60 programs? Y yes. Okay. The various ones that are identified in statute. And then the cost, as we looked at this two years ago, and I don't remember exactly, but it was nine figures if I... No, I, th I think it's 400 plus million dollars, and I'm going to lean across my shoulder here. Pardon me. Well, that would be nine figures. <laughs> is that nine yeah, figures? So, yeah, we're talking about real money. Yeah, well, and I, I just feel like the taxpayers don't really understand that they're sending Oklahoma kids to college on on our scholarship. I mean, on our tax dollars. Uh, if a, a kid wants to attend, you know, Midwestern in Wichita Falls, and he's from Oklahoma, and he could get an Oklahoma grant or you know scholarship, that makes sense. I have no problem with that. But it seems odd that we t just clearly let kids from other states apply for our tax dollars. The folks in Oklahoma would love to have our high achieving students oh. and they waive they waive their tuition to recruit our students yeah, as well. Yeah, I think Arkansas does as well. There are like various states around Texas that do the so same. So we're just reciprocating, is that Well, the there's thought? reciprocal agreements and then in the graduate programs, there's national reciprocal. You know, maybe it's unwritten, but it's if I'm a grad student, Grad students don't pay out-of-state tuition. They pay in-state tuition. They Janelle, all, it's they called chicken stealing. Well, I <laughs> go to somebody else's coop. Sorry, I took us chickens. off subject here, uh, Chairman. I'm thinking it's Chair Heldon Fells, one of his favorite topics to talk about. So well, and yes, and Chris has a great point. Do they stay here and and you know provide us great skills and and knowledge and businesses, or do they all go home? We like to think that our in-state student, students that leave to go out of state come back because why would you want to go someplace else? You'd have to ask somebody from Oklahoma that question. <laughs> Any other questions for Dan? <laughs> there's, there's a lot of information in here and a lot of, a lot of potential questions. Read chapter and I do want to yeah. remind you that uh, we'll, we'll provide you the link to the full report so you can go look to your heart's, heart's content. Okay, I need a motion to adopt the report on financial aid. Second. 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 Needed a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Dan. All right, item six, auditing. Uh, agenda item 6A is an update on internal audit report. Uh, this item is a reporting item only and does not require committee action. Mark Pell will present this item. Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I have uh, just a quick roadmap here, six items to cover with you this afternoon and uh, the first five will be informational only and then the last one will be uh, seeking your approval. So the first item is uh, an update on internal audit reports. We issued three. Uh, we issued two reports during the period um, that are in your materials. Uh, one is review of telecommuting practices, uh, second review of loan refunds and then we um, concluded uh, some investigatory work and so I'd uh, just like to cover uh, those projects and uh, address any questions that you may have. The uh, review of telecommuting practices, uh, as you may recall, we established a report rating system. Uh, this particular report received a category two rating, meaning that it had some uh, findings and recommendations. Um, if those findings and, and recommendations are addressed, um, 
uh, in a satisfactory manner by management, then uh, we feel like the risk uh, to the agency is, uh, is minimal. Um, and so that's uh, the case with this particular telecommuting project. There were three findings um, uh, that you'll see uh, in the audit report that's in your materials. Uh, gaps and in inconsistencies in record keeping re related to telecommuting. Uh, the need for more comprehensive policies and forms uh, and accessibility of that information. And then lastly, better guidance for supervisors on communicating and monitoring telecommuting staff. Uh, this is a benefit type of area for the agency. Um, about 13% of the agency's employees are participating in this telecommuting um, arrangement. And so, um, so the report, the recommendations, and if you'll even notice in the appendices, we included some specific lists of uh, suggestions in terms of policy improvement and improvement to forms um, and we feel like if if those uh, lists are used in connection with the recommendations in the report that it will really uh, position the agency to protect this benefit for the employees and um, and move forward in a way that where the risk is uh, is kept at an acceptable level uh, any questions on the telecommuting practices report? Just quickly, so 13% are participating. Does that mean all week, part of the week? How it, does that work? It actually varies. Um, probably most commonly is, is a day or potentially two days. Um, is per the most, week? Per week, okay. yes. The uh, review of loan refunds, I'll just mention one um, aspect of that particular project. That we came back with the no findings um, report in that area. You heard earlier Susan Warren covered uh, some issues with you that pertain to situations where a payor pays uh, more than the minimum amount due on, uh, on a number of loans that they may have, and that created some issues within Helms that um, related to how the additional dollars get applied to that portfolio of loans that that payer has. This particular project didn't look at it from that standpoint. This was looking at situations where an actual check is cut to an individual because they are owed. They may have one loan in, in the most simple example and the final payment and they pay more than what um, the final amount due was they're owed a refund. So we were looking at it from a safeguarding of assets standpoint, segregation of duties, computer controls related to the release of those funds. And so I'm pleased to report that from that standpoint, um, the loan um, refund process uh, has good controls. The, uh, the last uh, item on the internal audit report um, agenda topic is uh, the complaint. And that was a complaint that we received actually dating back to last summer. And uh, it was uh, a fairly broad, all-encompassing complaint. Um, probably the most common theme is that it related to uh, the administration of international programs at A&M Commerce. Um, as is typical in cases like this, we reached out to, um, in this case, the A&M System Internal Audit function and worked um, collaboratively with them as well as of course keeping the state auditor's office uh, informed of, uh, of our work. a um, and system came back with a report that indicated a number of management related issues associated with the administration of those international graduate programs um, at a and Commerce. Uh, we worked within this agency uh, with Dr. Gardner's area at that time, um, McKinsey, uh, Mac, and we got their advice on aspects of the complaint that potentially could, um, since they were it was largely academically oriented complaints, we wanted to know what was the risk to the coordinating board. And so the, the primary risk that was considered at that time was formula funding and whether or not there were any uh, formula funding implications to the agency. So we did some work from our side um, and actually determined uh, definitively that there were no uh, formula funding errors, that, that the classes for those international program uh, programs that were um, 
uh, at AM Commerce that they were that was all counted correctly and, and applied correctly. So we closed it out with the state auditor's office, as did um, Texas AM system. That concludes my update on for certainly. was this one complaint or was it multiple complaints? It was a, sing, a single complaint. One single complaint. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? We'll go to item 6B is an update on internal audit activities. This item is a reporting item only and does not require committee action. Thank you. This is a, um, uh, we, we certainly have a full plate of topics today, so I'll, um, there's a, a few things on this particular update that are covered on other agenda items. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly and I'll address any questions that you may have. Um, Certainly, we completed the uh, audits and investigations that I just covered with you for the um, current reporting period. We have three projects that are in progress uh, right now, that being a uh, college work study. We're doing a sunset implementation assessment, and we're also working um, uh, with planning and accountability on an accountability measures uh, audit. and. So all three of those projects will be reported to you um, in the October meeting. We have a no number of strategic uh, uh, things that are in progress, um, and our next agenda topic will actually focus on the external peer review um, and the results of that review. Um, we, uh, our final topic for today will be the annual audit plan uh, for your consideration and approval. Um, we continue to work with KPMG with the State Auditor's Office uh, and coordinating uh, the audit efforts as it pertains to uh, this agency. And with that, I'll address any uh, questions or comments. All right, so item 6C is a draft report on the external quality assessment of the internal audit activity at the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Once again, it is a, item is a reporting item only and does not require committee action. Thank you again, Mr. Jenkins. Um, as a sort of a background reminder um, on this particular item, last fall we worked with the committee regarding uh, who would perform the assessment of, uh, of the internal audit function here at the agency. And with the committee's feedback and some discussion, we chose the Institute of Internal Auditors and actually wanted them to come into the agency and do a, a full-blown assessment of the function. There were some options there. We could have done a self-assessment and then had some validation, but I think the committee um, certainly, Mr. Lalani and others wanted um, a, a, a more comprehensive uh, on-site evaluation. So that's what um, that's what was performed. Uh, the Institute of Internal Auditors uh, rendered a draft report. They actually conducted the review in May and, and issued the report uh, that same month. And that's the report that you have in your materials today. Um, I emphasize draft because in my discussions with Mr. Lalani, he wanted to make sure that the committee, as well as management, was engaged in the discussion of, of what the results of this uh, external review were. Some of the items are fairly specific to the practice of internal audit within the agency, but there are a couple of items with broader implications, and uh, I, I think Mr. Lalani wanted to make sure that there was uh, a good, healthy discussion of, of those items before we formulated uh, management responses and, and I guess formalize those responses. Um, so the, the draft report that you have in your materials does not have a management response yet. You were just uh, handed a document that actually has a proposed management response and that's uh, certainly subject to change and subject to, uh, to discussion or actually Sharon is, uh, is providing that to you now. Um, what the other thing that Mr. Lalani uh, uh, wanted for this particular presentation is he felt like it would be good if the actual team leader that performed the assessment could brief you on the results as opposed to me. I'll certainly be here and uh, be happy to answer questions or participate in the discussion, but uh, we looked at options of bringing the team leader back down for, uh, for the presentation, but ultimately uh, decided in the interest of cost um, to have the uh, presentation done um, by telephone. So um, 
with that sort of prelude with the materials that you were just handed, what I would like to do is introduce, give you just a quick introduction of the team leader that conducted the assessment. Um, he will walk you through the report, sort of the key points of that report, and then we'll, we can have a discussion or entertain any um, uh, questions or comments at that point. Mr. George Shimo is a CPA and a certified fraud examiner uh, with extensive audit experience. <clears throat> he is the former director of internal audit at the New York State Comptroller's Office for over 20 years. Prior to that, he held positions with the New York State Teachers Retirement System and in public accounting. We're very fortunate to have someone of George's caliber as our team <coughs> lead, as he has conducted literally dozens of external quality assessments of internal audit functions in the public and private sector and at institutions of higher education. And with that, hopefully with the technology cooperating, I will now turn the discussion over to Mr. Shimo. Mark, I can hear you fine. Can you all hear me very well? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, very good. Well, first of all, good afternoon and greetings to you all in the uh, wonderful city of Austin, Texas. Hope everyone's doing fine and, and things are cool down there. I understand it might be a little bit warm. Always uh, is. Yes. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, by the way, I think uh, the only reason we're doing this on the phone was Mark had enough of me and decided <laughs> probably was the best thing to just keep me right here in upstate New York. <laughs> Uh, and I'm just kidding, Mark. <laughs> uh, <laughs> listen, I, I'm, I'm just going to make a, a few brief observations, and I, what I would really like to focus on uh, is to be able to try to answer questions that you might have, and I think that there probably are maybe one or two issues that uh, we might want to focus on. So, so first of all, let me, let me start off by saying that uh, uh, this process of, of quality review is, is basically mostly a judgmental process uh, based on observation of a couple of professionals. And a gentleman by the name of Dave McCabe assisted me on this. Dave is a, uh, a resident of the city of Austin. Um, and when we, and we, by the way, I've done probably more than a do dozens of these. I've done over 100 of these reviews at this point in time. And one of the things that I, I walk away from every review is kind of a, uh, I guess, a, a feeling of, of what took place during the course of the review. And usually it's either you know, you hope hope for the best. There wasn't great cooperation, uh, or you have wonderful cooperation, and you walk away and you say that was one really, really good review, uh, and that is most definitely the case uh, with uh, THECB, uh, the review that we did uh, of Mark's operation. And uh, you know, quite frankly, it's due to the cooperation of Mark, but also uh, of the ma senior management group and operating managers, and, and also. Um, the, the chair of the uh, AOC and a few other individuals thrown in. Uh, everybody was, was open and frank, and quite frankly, that allows us to do, uh, I think, a, a very, very, very good evaluation. Uh, the results of that evaluation, uh, I think, are quite, uh, I, think, I think they're great. Uh, first of all, we did come away with an overall conclusion that, that Mark's Internal Audit Department uh, is in general conformance with the standards uh, overall, and that is the best you can do. You, you don't get an outstanding. All you do is you get generally conforms, and Mark has achieved that. Uh, and the other thing is that in, in coming to that overall conclusion, we actually evaluate each and every standard uh, within the, the body of standards from the IIA. Uh, and I would say probably somewhere on average of five to six Specific standards are usually uh, identified as being what we call partial conformance. In Mark's case, there were only two, and I think that's quite an outstanding um, achievement on, on Mark's part. Uh, his office is, is not that large, and he has done a great job uh, in meeting all those standards. And, and I think the final result is, is this. The senior management group and the AOC can have a very high degree of reliance and confidence that your internal audit department is providing you with the support that you need to operate in an in, in a environment of good governance, proper risk management, and a well-controlled environment. And I think Mark is supporting you in that way uh, 100%. So we were very happy with, with the result that we came away, well, we came away with in the review. Um, it, I guess the only thing I can do is go through uh, uh, the findings uh, very briefly. 
we had two of them that were addressed to uh, the board and <laughs> management. And the first one, I think, was directly addressed to the AOC itself. And that was, we would suggest that you do have a, a written charter. Uh, one of the things that we detected in, in our interviews was there may have been a little bit of blurring between the responsibilities of the um, administrative reporting line to management and a functional reporting re line to, to the committee. Uh, there were no problems in terms of independence or anything like that, but that written charter would be very helpful to very, very clearly lay out the different responsibilities. So we, we would encourage you to do that, but that, that has that's more of a successful practice that had no impact uh, on evaluating the standards, okay? Uh, the second one that we've addressed to management, and I think we want to talk a little bit more about this, uh, is talking about the approach to uh, organizing the compliance group, uh, something that, that I'll talk more in, in, at length as we go back to it. Uh, but I think we do want that uh, on the table. We do want to talk about that. In, in terms of the items that we identified for internal audit specifically, as I mentioned, there were two standards uh, that we had uh, uh, rated as PC. Uh, the first one dealt with the quality assurance program that Mark has in place, and he does have a proper assurance program in place, but there are a couple of elements that need to be added to it. Uh, and just quickly, he needs to be able to do his own annual periodic self-assessment uh, and also probably enhance the uh, performance measures that he reports out to senior management and the committee. Uh, those two items will help him bring his uh, program into full conformance uh, with that particular standard. And then the, the second area that we, we encourage Mark to take some action in, uh, and again, I think the uh, uh, committee will need to, to also get involved in this, uh, is the approach to developing an identification of the actual resources required to provide the board uh, with the proper audit coverage. And one of the things that needs to be done is that between the uh, AOC and internal audit and senior management come to some understanding about over what period of time the various elements of risk, the, the functions within those elements, need to be reviewed. We call that a frequency schedule. Uh, that, will able to, that will allow Mark to actually quantify and I think more specifically allow the board, the committee, and management understand what really is needed in terms of resources to properly support the organization from an audit perspective. And, and hand in hand with that, uh, we, we also I've identified, and this is the same standard, uh, feel that the identification of your IT resource, the, the board's resource, uh, needs to be further uh, and more detailed, I think, evaluation of that to determine exactly what elements of IT need to be reviewed and to what depth we need to go there. So roughly those two elements would cause us to, to uh, rate that particular standard, communication of the resource needs for the organization as being a partial conformance. Okay? And then the other element we, we thought uh, that we would be helpful for Mark to do uh, is as you drill down into the depths of operating management, uh, you know, at the executive and senior levels, the understanding of what Mark does and the appreciation for what Mark does, I think, is, 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 is very, very sound, very good. Uh, as you drill down into the operating management group, sometimes they may not have as, uh, uh, I guess, a, a deep appreciation for what internal audit is doing. So what we're asking Mark to do is maybe expand his outreach program a little bit, just to try to educate them a little bit. Uh, maybe put them at ease a little bit in terms of being involved with internal audit. Okay, so so that in a nutshell is the report. Uh, I, I think you should be very proud of Mark. Uh, I I came away from from the uh, review with a very very positive vibes. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the group and fire away with whatever questions you have. Questions for uh, Mr. Shimo? Excuse me. I was asking the group if they have any questions for you. Okay. I, I, I certainly would like to talk about the conformance group if we want to talk about that. That'd be fine. Okay. Uh, it, it was my understanding, uh, and, and, and I have to tell you, when I, I've got, I got a lot of information from Mark prior to my coming on site in Austin to actually do the review. That's the standard part of the process. Uh, one of the things, and without talking to Mark about anything that I, I looked at, I looked at, uh, the forming of a separate 
compliance group outside of internal audit, separate from internal audit. And I basic question I asked was, I said, why? Okay. And that was high on my agenda of things to look at when I got on site. And when I got on site, we started talking to Mark about it. I think we talked about it in some of the interviews uh, that we held uh, with the uh, audit chair, with the AOC chair, uh, the commissioner, and, and uh, the uh, CFO, COO, okay, about this particular issue. Uh, I was led to believe that the reason the Sunset Commission wanted it separated was that they felt it was a violation of the standards to combine this process with internal audit. And, and, and quite frankly, that is very far from the case. Um, from my perspective, compliance reviewing, determining compliance of third parties with your procedures, your contracts, your processes, is merely one of the audit functions that your internal audit group probably should be doing. If, it, if the need arises that you want to separate it <laughs> under the one director between internal audit work and external compliance work, I guess you could do that. Uh, I don't, I'm not really sure I see the need to do that. Uh, I, I would certainly would see the need to identify a certain amount of resources to do the external work, but to me it's all audit work, and that certainly, certainly would not be in conflict with any of the, inter the IIA standards to put that whole thing together. And, in fact, I think from the positive aspect, it, it puts both audit functions under the one director following the body of standards that gives it discipline, consistency, and understandability from management's perspective. And the information that is looked at at the third parties on the outside is actually the information that's feeding the processes inside that internal audit is looking at anyway. So to me, it all goes together, and I'm, I'm not sure where the Sunset Commission is coming from. I have reached out to uh, a contact person that Mark gave me. I've made a few calls, have not gotten a call back, uh, but I anticipate having a, an opportunity uh, to discuss this with that person. So, so with that, uh, any questions on that? Well, and that, that is key in, in trying to understand, you know, the time frame of understanding what their response back to your position on that and then, then where we go from there. I, I mean, I'm anxious to hear what their response would be and, and what their rationalization of it is, particularly from your perspective as what you've articulated to us, which makes makes sense to me sitting here at this spot. Um, so I'd love to hear what, what, what comes of that and then help us guide us to what we do next. Okay. Well, I, I have reached out to Sarah Kirkle a couple of times now and have not gotten a call back. So uh, if, we, if we want, if somebody from there wants to get a hold of her and remind her that I'm trying to reach out to her, uh, if you want to give my contact information, which I have left with her, uh, but I would encourage you to do that and ask her to give me a call back. We'll, we'll uh, do that from this end so that she can have that conversation with you so we can understand uh, what comes of that discussion. Okay. D d does anybody on the AOC or senior management have any questions about uh, the position that the IA would take from a standard standpoint? No. Okay. I don't. I'm no, just speaking no, to me. Thank you. I agree. Okay. Are, are there any other questions about the report in, in general? I don't think so, um, Mr. Shimo. We really appreciate the work on this, and it sounds very thorough, and it sounds like it was a, a, a good process working with uh, Mark and the team, and we would greatly appreciate it. Okay. Well, I, I want to wish uh, the board continued success. Uh, I, I think you've got a very good operation going there, uh, and continue good luck. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the summer up there. We certainly will. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Appreciate Thanks. it. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Mr. Right. Chairman, I, I kind of got to the point that we have a pretty good audit program That's here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All I know is I, I feel very happy but, about it, very, very positive. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess we're going to finish up here. Um, item uh, 6D, discussion of auditor rotation as it pertains to the quality of financial audits. Mark. Thank you. Uh, these next two items uh, are actually, uh, they were items that I had discussions with Mr. Lalani, and he had asked for uh, some information to be gathered and presented uh, to the committee, so it's unfortunate that he's he's not here today. But I certainly would like to uh, share the information with you and get your uh, 
uh, get your views or your feedback. Um, so the first item is the discussion of auditor rotation as it pertains to uh, the quality of financial audits. And I guess the fundamental question here is whether or not periodic auditor rotation uh, improves audit quality or audit independence. And so you have some information that's in your packet um, uh, that really kind of gives you some high points of this ongoing uh, debate. That document is called Consideration of External Auditor Rotation. Um, a lot of this dates back to, from a chronology of events standpoint, back to 2002 with uh, SOX creating um, the PCAOB uh, to provide really um, kind of a watchdog or oversight of, uh, of the uh, profession of auditing um, uh, here. And so another thing that SOX did at that time was it tasked GAO with studying this particular issue, whether or not mandatory auditor rotation for external auditors uh, was something that would be beneficial and would improve audit uh, quality and independence. Uh, in 2003, GAO came back and basically said, we can't answer that question definitively. We don't have evidence to suggest that if you do require mandatory rotation, let's say every five years or seven years, that that's, gonna, uh, that that's going to improve things. I, I think there was some evidence on both sides uh, of the argument there. Um, so. They went back, um, a number of years went by, um, kind of fast forwarding to more recent times, 2011. Uh, there's another um, uh, concept released by PCAOB, still studying the same um, uh, phenomenon. There's still a healthy debate on both sides of the, of the argument there, um, and, and still nothing definitive that's been, um, that's been pronounced that would impact um, certainly this agency's um, uh, use of, uh, of an external auditor to, to conduct our financial statement um, opinion audit. In terms of this agency, uh, just to give you a, a perspective, um, you also have in your materials there a handout um, that shows our uh, external audit history that began in 2006. Um, you can see that the process back then was initiated with a competitive procurement um, uh, from a competitive procurement standpoint, solicitation, uh, evaluation of respondents, and so forth. Um, then again in 2009, and then again in fiscal year 2012. So we've been through three competitive processes looking at, uh, at providers of external auditing services. In each of those cases, KPMG was selected as the best qualified, uh, the best uh, uh, in a position to perform the service uh, for this agency. Um, the current status is that with the completion of the work that was just reported to you, we have the option now to renew uh, each of the next two years. Um, or the committee could choose to, uh, to go back to the table to the competitive process and we would come back in October, seek your approval uh, to issue an RFI to go back through the competitive procurement process and, and see what those um, results would yield. Um, in terms of, I guess, other things that impact audit quality, I, I think a lot of the literature suggests that the engagement of the audit committee um, is key. The engagement in evaluating the external audit services that are being provided and using senior management and using the internal audit function, getting feedback from various parties, and really how satisfied are you in whether or not the external auditor is responding affirmatively to the questions that you ask or what your particular needs are. There are tools to help guide that evaluation process, certainly we could come to the table with additional tools that would be sort of an evaluation matrix, um, if you will, that would uh, maybe structure the process a little bit more than what it is um, right now. I know that currently I receive uh, a document from the Texas State Auditor's Office uh, on the A133 work that's done by KPMG where they're asking, you know, how effectively is the, is the work done. Um, we report the results of the financial statement audit to the state auditor's office. So, from a contracting standpoint, they're well aware of what uh, of what the agency is doing, and actually, they approve for us to engage 
um, an external auditor. So um, there are some other things out there, but I think Mr. Lalani just wanted a presentation of the fact that, you know, th th there is the question of whether or not an auditor, an, an audit firm can become too comfortable um, and too close to management. And I think that's um, <coughs> what he wanted some feedback on. Mark, in, in, your, in your opinion, is there uh, any compelling reason that we would want to change from KPMG? I mean, we, if anything, we want them to to delve into operations. The board wants them to delve into it. I think Arturo would be in the same boat as you would be. Uh, if I'm understanding what you're saying, it's merely you don't necessarily need to go get a new audit firm. You're looking at the requirement that maybe the audit partner and the manager or whatever uh, rotate rather than Certainly. us rotating a complete to a complete different auditor. Certainly. And I, I have it, no indication, it, no, no uh, uh, concern or anything like that. Um, you can see from the materials that I put in there that KPMG um, has a 10-year uh, partner rotation uh, policy within the firm. So, you know, you go back to the timeline from 2006 by 2016. Um, right, anyway. Right. So um, there are some things in place, certainly. Okay. And, and, and from an operational standpoint, Arturo, I mean, what, what have you found in your experience as far as utilization of a particular firm? With this particular, I mean, do firm? you do you have? Is there anything wrong? No, there are no there concerns on my part, uh, uh, Harold. Uh, you know, I my experience with uh, KPMG has been nothing but uh, professional, uh, very very much on the professional side, uh, fair, thorough, of course. But uh, I, I don't have any concerns uh, myself. It was was this just for yeah you know and I think I think it was a good exercise to be keep keep this as a, a, a thought process to be you know uh, uh, Meniere's looking at, at, at analyzing the different things and it's a good good exercise to think about these things and I think that what we've seen in, in this thinking is that we we're in a good stead at the moment we're going to be rotating 2016 regardless um, and so we're probably in, in in a good position where we are currently would that be right Mark yes okay. Good. Well, thank you for thank you. that. Uh, item 6E is a discussion on board and executive management travel expense reporting. This item is a reporting item only and does not require committee action. Mark. Thank you. Again, this is an item that I had a discussion with, uh, with Mr. Lalani. Uh, I think that one of the things that he was, uh, and you have in your materials an example um, expenditure report, I believe um, Mr. Lalani's uh, thought process um, and the discussion that he wanted to promote uh, is the issue of transparency uh, related to uh, board expenditures and, um, and really to sort of guard against um, reputational risk uh, in the event that um, uh, there was impropriety or maybe not even impropriety, but uh, if something didn't pass the smell test, if you will, um, in the media, uh, you know, is there something that could uh, alert management or the AOC in advance such that um, uh, some corrective action or some discussions could take place? So it, it's not a question of whether or not uh, board travel expenses are, uh, are legal. Um, there, there's a process in place, certainly, to you know, reimburse uh, board members for their travel expenses, as is reflected on the schedule that you have with you. It, it is a question of whether or not it's sort of the old legal versus prudent um, perspective. And so I think Mr. Lalani is, is wanting to shine some light on the prudent side of the house. And, and if you present expenditures in a comparative format such as what is presented to you then perhaps questions could be asked um, if somebody uh, a particular member was you know at ten times the uh, uh, travel expenses of another member and yet the type of event that they're attending is the same there's a lot of other obviously factors that play into that the <coughs> distance to travel and uh, 
length of the stay and, and things like that, but it could serve as a triggering mechanism if something was, was really um, amiss. And so a consideration at this point in time, what uh, Mr. Lalani had indicated to me was present this particular report for discussion. If it was felt appropriate uh, to produce something like this, then perhaps produce it on an annual uh, basis. We could do it after the end of the fiscal year, uh, so say at the October meeting, um, so not this October, but let's say going forward, if we gathered the expenditures for FY14 and then pr presented um, in October of 2014 the result of that previous fiscal year, um, this is kind of what that would look like. I, I think that um Munir really was also wanting everyone to know what is the cost of governance and what is um, what's best practice and obviously transparency is always best practice so right. I appreciate this and you can see that I don't eat as much as the men do so thank you. <laughs> however that's one that I think we should look into <laughs> it's a pretty exorbitant amount there you've been expending we, we can argue this for a long time you won't win <laughs> I'm I'm trying to win by spending the most, Janelle. So so I think we should publish these a lot. I agree. <laughs> well, all right. So to that to that point, as the AOC committee, we can make that recommendation that we feel comfortable having this in in the name of transparency. That just what you said, Mark, uh, on an annual basis, uh, we'll recap the previous year and put it in a format like this that's available to to be looked at. Sure. So it's, Right there in front of everybody. So I have a motion to that effect. Yeah, I don't so move. I, I don't believe this is. Uh, it, this was the information. It's not an action item. But that's why I would ask. Right. That's why I was asking. So it's just the discussion, and I think we have your feedback, which right. is what okay. Manuel wanted. So okay. that's, well, that's my comment yeah. was to move to the next item, not to move. <laughs> oh, what's this? <laughs> This took your move. My, just just, to, just to follow up one more, uh, <laughs> and, and I agree with the transparency, and I, I think we do need to make sure that everything is out there. But, uh, Mark, from your standpoint, from an audit standpoint, or Arturo, are there, is there any reason to be concerned? No, this was, this was purely based on my discussion with, uh, with okay. Mr. Mr. Right. Okay, so the point is, Nobody has any problems with this philosophically. And so this just becomes an action item? That's mm -hmm. like, if we, yes. It doesn't uh, need it, it, Right. Okay. Yeah. We, we'll get back with the chairman and we'll tell him what the discussion was and what the feeling and the feedback we have. And then we'll work with him on the frequency and so forth. And, uh, but that's what he wanted. He wanted the committee to have that discussion. Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the consensus of the committee is clear. Right. And without taking a vote, because a vote would be precluded since it was not placed on the agenda as an action item. Okay. But I think that the consensus being clear, Mark's going to take that and implement it. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. All right. Last agenda item under the... Uh, Auditing is agenda item 6F, consideration of approval of the risk-based audit work plan for year 2014. Mark. Thank you. This item seeks your approval for the 2014 internal audit work plan. Uh, your materials include the 2014 proposed work plan, uh, and we also put a supporting schedule to show you how we compute uh, the number of audit hours that are available. Uh, this is a risk-based plan. That's what's required by professional audit standards and the Texas Internal Auditing Act. Uh, I will mention to you the plan uh, reflects a shift of assurance resources within the agencies from internal audit to compliance monitoring. Uh, you'll see a reduction in FTEs uh, in the resources that we use to, to prepare the plan from three to two on the internal audit side while at the same time, uh, from the plan that, um, that Arturo presented to you earlier on the compliance side, those FTEs increased from two to four. Um, all of those being, as Mr. Shimo pointed out, 
related to uh, assurance and compliance. So we went from two to four on the compliance side. We went from uh, three to two on the internal audit side, and that's what the plan um, uh, reflects. Uh, Sharon just provided to you um, an additional supplemental schedule. I wanted to show you our uh, long-range audit plan. One of the items that Mr. Shimo very quickly went through earlier uh, was related to the board's, I guess, understanding of how long it takes us to cycle through the various areas of the agency. So the schedule that you have um, shows that that to get to each of the major areas within the organization uh, with the shift or, or with the resources that are presented in the plan at two takes us about four years to cycle through those areas. You'll also see the X's across the top of that plan that there are certain functions that are so uh, uh, significant in terms of, of financial uh, magnitude, uh, reputational risk, complexity that we want to have uh, uh, work going on in those areas every year. Information technology is an example of, of one of those areas. Um, but that gives you a perspective of, of how we apply our resources and how long it takes us to, uh, to have a presence within some of the other areas that may not be as significant, but certainly still warrant um, a periodic uh, uh, look just to, to uh, be able to look at all the areas of the agency. Um, we include hours in the plan to cover uh, follow-up um, work, so uh, like the uh, report that I just presented to you on telecommuting practices and management in indicates implementation dates for those three items of November 1st, so sometime later um, in FY14 we'll come back through and do a follow-up assessment and a report on, uh, on the status of, of management's implementation. Um, of those actions, those action <coughs> items. Um, I'll be happy to address any uh, questions that you may have about particular audits. You can see we covered IT. Um, we have uh, contract management. A, a lot of these uh, projects or the proposed scope for these projects comes about because of discussions that I have during the annual planning process, I reach out to KPMG, I reach out to the state auditor's office, and then I meet with the executive team, obviously, within the agency, and we talk about risk, and we talk about uh, what the other audit organizations view as being risk, what their plans are in terms of, of future audits, and so sort of what comes out the pipe as a result of that process are projects that we want to schedule to uh, to address the areas that are collectively considered to be uh, risk to the agency. I had a quick question on uh, the ones that are done every four years, it looks like. Are some of those, I mean, is this a four-year because of the resources, or is that really truly risk-based, and it, that's what it would be independent? I think it's, it, it's primarily cyclical-driven. I, I think that the, the real risk basis is going to be on the, the, the higher risk areas are at the top of that chart. The other areas, um, I, I mean, the commissioner's office is an example. It's got a number of subunits, governmental um, relations, and, and uh, you know, those areas are clearly important to the agency, but in terms of uh, financial risk or, or uh, things like that, it doesn't need to be um, looked at clearly. You know, it's that in comparison to a loan operation um, or business office. And so the four-year cycle seems to be, is that a standard? Is that something that we have a high level of comfort with? I would say uh, th there's really not a standard for that. Um, it's sort of on a case-by-case -case basis, and I've had some discussions with uh, with uh, Arturo about this. You know, really, I go by empirical evidence, and, and so what makes me comfortable is conducting audits and coming back with audits that don't have huge problems and, and hearing KPMG deliver their financial audit results and not having huge issues and issuing a clean opinion and so forth. As long as the control environment of the agency remains strong um, and, and we're getting results of reviews like that, then I think you can start to, 
to expand that horizon, and that's why this move, this shift in resources from from three to two, uh, you know, it's certainly I think something that we want to keep an eye on going forward. We don't want to slip, um, but at the present time, I'm comfortable with that. Move to approve. I have a motion to approve. I do have a comment plan. first. Apparently, the chairman is watching online. He says to tell Harold that next time there is a dress code. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You guys, you guys didn't get you guys didn't get the memo, huh? That is, that is the desk. <laughs> this code. is the desk. <laughs> All right. So I, I I do have a motion. I need a second to approve the work plan. Second. Second. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you. And we this, do hope Manir is feeling better. We do hope he is feeling better, and we are glad that he is watching online. And our uh, best wishes are for him. So this does conclude the Agency and Operations Committee meeting. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Second. All right, great. Thank you very much. We are adjourned.